Can anybody hear me? Yes, Bob. Bob, I wait. Okay. How you doing? I'm gonna I'm gonna view the smart people today. <laughs> And we still got a few minutes up to mute and continue letting people in until three o'clock. Okay. Hey, Doug, thank you for that immediate response to me on that. <laughs> you're, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, I, I figure the least I can do is, is be responsive. Even when, if, if I ain't much use, I'll try to do it and be faster. Man. That was real fast. Yeah. I'll have to send that to all the uh, H, HCC board members so that yeah. they'll know they can. I use that word resign whenever they feel like they've had too much of it. <laughs> well, personally, I mean, right now we should have some who are already on uh, short term. So yeah, we got we got one. I think one would be uh, Bunny. Oh, Bunny would be coming up in June. Oh, is that then right? We, then we got I think two. Uh, maybe one in next year, and then two the next year, and then two the next year. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it'll work out. As long as they know that, as long as they know they're not, you know, that like you went, we had a tough time getting Ron to agree to to whatever I think he ended up having. So getting them right. to renew, I'd like to have him on, on that on this group. Yeah, I'd hate yeah. to not have Ron. Hate to not have we Ron. got great, we got great members right now, except Jeanette. She's no, no, oh, look, she's on. Oh, God, I didn't mean to say that. Look at her. Watch it. <laughs> just kidding. You know, I'm just kidding you. Jeanette's, a, Jeanette's what we call a recovering lawyer. <laughs> she doesn't find a lot of humor. She's not, she's talking, but you can't hear her because she's got her microphone. She, she's found a more a useful way. There to we go. Her. Sorry. I, I was just saying I hadn't quite recovered yet. <laughs> Some people never do. That's the problem. It's only been 20 years. So. <laughs> That's actually one of my brother's expressions, recovering lawyer. He, when he was the president of the bar, he used to talk about that in his speeches. I'll say we got five great, uh, five great board members from this on this initial HCC. I agree. Well, thank you. As Ron just came out, or he just waited till I said that. So. Can anybody oh. hear me? Yeah. Who is it, Wendell? Yeah. That is, it, that is I. Can you see me? No. Is that what you wanted? No, I want to be seen, man. Well, turn your video well, on then. I don't know how. I'm, I'm Look, stand there next to your microphone. Oh, there it is. Wendell, you have a you have a face. How about now? You have a face. Oh, oh face. gosh, <laughs> yes. That's a wild man. <laughs> Hi, Wendell. I've never already you got a face for radio, Wendell. <laughs> I think Wendell's frozen his video. Look at he just shares from this meeting. Lyle better take care of real quick while he's still, while it's the hand got out of hand. 
There's one leading back. Hi, Jim. Can you can you hear me? Russell Harville here. Russell, I can hear you, you and I can see you. Thanks, both of you. If, if you think it would help to take Connor, you probably could, but um, he's got stuff to do. Yeah, no, I, I should be able to hear it. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you? I'm good. You're sitting on the boulevard? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm front of that. Can't you see that sign behind me? <laughs> oh, I was going to say. Okay. Good to hear wow. Colby out there. Sun, sun is out right over here now, though, so that's good. Good deal. How's everybody doing today? Hey, wow. My brother, my brother killed a limit of mallards and, and grays yesterday out in West Tennessee. He's he's living the life, man. It's, that's, what happens when nice. you, that's what happens when you retire. Well, I'm due to go to Stuttgart soon, so we'll see. Right. Yeah. Well, there's Gavin Bocce Ball Duke over there. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Lyle? I'm good. How you doing? I'm I'm making it. Looks like, looks like we're still waiting on uh, Bunny. Bunny. There she is right there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it looks like we have everyone here. How you doing, Lyle? It's Nathan Lyons. Hey, Nathan, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. Now you're on mute. Uh. I think Bunny just dropped off. No, she didn't. She's Bunny's just, here. She just moved around this multiple screen. Okay. Okay. Mal's still muted up, though. He's going to unmute. Unless he wants to run this meeting in sign language. Russell, did your did your boy uh, graduate from Vanderbilt? He's a senior now, Jim, and he, you know, with this COVID, he got another year of eligibility, so he's going to get a master's degree. So he's got two more seasons if you count the springs. So he can play. He can play tennis for two for how how many years? Uh, like I can say this is his fourth year. Um, he plays number one for him. He moved up from all the way from six. So wow. pretty pretty good story. That's pretty that's pretty stout. That's number one at that level. Oh my. I was in Oklahoma visiting, watching the Vanderbilt basketball, uh, getting creamed down there. But <laughs> his son was playing tennis down there, and I we got some videos of him playing tennis while we were down there. Come on in. Come on. Number one now, huh? Wow. Yeah, you know your baseball team, Tim Corbin's got the same thing. All those great seniors are granted an extra year of eligibility. So yeah, but he but he lost a bunch last year, you know. So. Some of those guys, some of those guys, I think were eligible to turn to turn pro though, and Nate Mum did, you know, so we lost a good right. many players. We've got Rocker back for but only one more year. You know, he only got to play he only got to play one year. Let's say give him another year somehow. I know but he'll go, he's gonna be make so much money, he's gonna go as soon as he can yeah. sign that big contract. All right. Welcome everyone to the uh, December meeting of the historical zoning committee for um, city of Bellmead. Um, let's do a quick roll call for the record. 
Uh, Ron Ferris. Ron's muted. Here. Uh, Bonnie Blackman. Here. Jeanette Whitson. Jeanette's muted. Jeanette. You're, you're muted. I know. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, and Gavin Duke. Here. Um, first item is uh, approval of the minutes from the last month's meeting. Anyone have changes, um, complications, additions, deletions? I do not. Okay. Uh, I do I have a motion for approval? Make a motion to approve, Gavin. I second the motion, Jeanette. Uh, Bunny. Aye. Jeanette. Aye. Gavin. Aye. Ron. Aye. And Mal votes aye. Um, I also note for the record that we are um, joined today by uh, Beth Reardon, City Manager, Lyle Patterson, City Building Instru uh, Building Official, Edie Glasser, City Recorder, Doug Berry, the City Attorney, and the Good Mayor. So a quick word about uh, procedures. Lyle will introduce each case, each application. Uh, the applicant and or his representatives can present their case and why their application should be approved. The board will discuss the issue, ask questions. Comments will be solicited uh, from anyone in attendance who wishes to speak. And if you do speak, please identify yourself um, for the record. Um, after we have solicited comments from the uh, public, the public portion of the meeting will be closed. The board will deliberate among themselves and vote either to approve, to deny, or defer. So with that, Lau, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to add to that. If each one of you would please speak very clearly uh, into your microphones, we're using an automatically transcribed service called Otter. Um, each of you has submitted thumbnails. If you would just call those out, I'm going to share my screen with you for each applicant, and I'll try to get to those as quickly as possible. First item under old business is the application for a certificate of appropriateness for Paul Brevet, 1220 Chickering Road, for the demolition of existing home, property of significance, and construct a new single family home. <clears throat> This is we ready, Lyle? How about it? Um, good afternoon, Lyle and members of the commission. My name is Russell Harwell. My law firm represents the owners of the property at 1220 Chickering Road. And as you know, they seek approval of the application for demolition previously filed with the city. I'm about to turn this over to Rocky King in about 90 seconds, but I'd like to make two points. First, and, and I don't know if this is procedurally appropriate to poll the commission member, so I'm not going to do that, but I would be curious of how many of you have actually been inside this home, inside and out. Uh, I know, you know, Ron, I believe you had a project for a potential client a few years ago, and I'm sure you've looked at it closely. Gavin, I know you've done work for the owners there, but that's probably just landscaping. You know, others of you, Jeanette, Bunny, you know, maybe back when Roger and Francis lived here, you might have been there like I have. But I, I mentioned that only because to the extent this is not going to be approved to allow the replacement construction of a legacy home that will benefit the city. I, I hope that you will take the time to do an inspection. You know, we can take the time, you can mask up, we can do it socially distance, see every single room in the house and see the outside, outside of it. Maybe, maybe you've already done that. So I'll throw that out there. The second thing I'd like to mention is my friend Doug Berry, colleague from the Nashville Bar, pointed out at our November 10 hearing, which I thought was very important to mention again, 
And as we know, Mr. Mr. Hinton made a presentation that we saw for the first time at the hearing. And what Doug, I think, was smart to point out, and which he can do a lot more astutely than I can, is the importance of this commission to establish findings of fact and conclusions of law for the record. And with all due respect to Mr. Hinton, and I love Sieb Tuck and their work for decades in this town, a number of facts were incorrect and arguably misleading from the last hearing. And I'm gonna turn it over now to my partner, Rocky King. Thank you, Russell. Uh, I too will be brief in, in my remarks. There's just a couple of points I wanna touch upon relating to this before I turn that over to, to Wendell, uh, who is a contractor who's worked on this property, who offer a, a treasure trove of information as compared to lawyers. Uh, the one point that I wanna touch upon is there's been a lot of ink spilled about who was Welby Pugin and what he has done. I saw the opposition's response uh, to us minutes ago, and I looked back through our own submission, and I just kind of wanted to talk about Mr. Pugin for a second. The issue we have with Mr. Pugin, and, and frankly, no one knew he was involved with this parcel until, yesterday, until last meeting. When this was brought up initially by Mr. Tarot to this commission uh, 60 days before the November meeting, no, no mention of Mr. Pugin. And when we've gone through and we've done our research about Mr. Pugin, we haven't found a lot about him. And I think the opposition would kind of respectfully agree with that. He's not on the uh, register, uh, registry like Mr. Keeble is. He's not on the registry like other architects are. The only time he is on the registry is for the Mississippi home and in that submission that we've provided to y'all, more was, or equal amounts was spent talking about his family lineage through his father as compared to his own works on his own regard. That's not done to insult Mr. Pugin. That's done to demonstrate the fact that there's not a lot to talk about Mr. Pugin. Mr. Pugin's had some very nice works, but I think everyone on this commission would agree that he is no keeper. Uh, one thing I do want to correct, just so there is no mistake, because I think um, the opposition, Mr. Hinton, myself, we're all dealing with history and a lot of hard information to find. And unfortunately, because of COVID, I'm not allowed to go to archives and pull stuff myself. Uh, we have made the point that none of Mr. Pugin's properties are on the registry. In fact, some of them have been demolished, such as First Church through our uh, suit, through our research showing that it had been condemned. Uh, we had made the statement that Sherwood had been similarly demolished. It's not that it's been demolished. It's not listed on the registry. So I wanted to correct that fact. Even though Sherwood still stands today, it's not on the registry. Uh, so I wanted to correct that statement just so we're all clear on that issue. The thing I will say, and this is my tee up for Mr. Harmer, who I joke before everyone joined, has a voice and face for radio um, <laughs> to talk to you all about what we discussed at the prior hearing was that whatever Mr. Pugin did and whatever Mr. Keeble did, frankly, is not there anymore. And Mr. Harmer comes at this with a unique perspective because I frankly, and, and to know, I'm not throwing fault on him, he a lot of times was the wrecking ball that removed these elements because he is the contractor on this home since 1994. So with that, um, Lyle, I'm gonna ask you to bring up the PowerPoint presentation we've sent you. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Harmer so he can drive. And at the very end, I'm going to come back to you briefly and discuss what we're requesting. What we are requesting, and you will see at the end of these slides, is that we be remove this structure for the reasons we've already discussed and simultaneously construct the home that is at the end of this presentation. We have tremendous value community. It is designed with a tip of the hat to the history of this community. It is going to be consistent. And all the owners are asking for is the opportunity to design what is drawn and to engage in the collaborative process with this commission. And with that, I'm gonna mute myself and take myself off video and let Mr. Farmer speak to what actually is there at this home. Wendell? Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> everybody. And uh, I want to start by just saying, thank you, commission, for what you're doing. I know, uh, can everybody hear me, first of all? Yes. Okay. I know, uh, you know, having dealt with the history 
I've been in, I, I, I grew up in Belmead, still live in Belmead. I'm a resident. I practiced uh, 22 or three years of contracting in Belmead, specifically restoring old homes. <clears throat> I've worked with every commission, board of zoning appeals, every, every element uh, in, in trying to keep our city beautiful, okay? I go, George Crook was a client of mine. I go back to, to his desire to keep the city beautiful when he was mayor. Had similar conversations with Julia Landstreet, my neighbor and client, similar with Peggy Warner. Um, so I understand the task that you all are, are dealt with. And I just want to say that, that your commission will, would do well and be a value to our city if it really focuses on how we can get what our clients want and keep pr preserve the beauty in our city. Um, and I think some of the old uh, methods of attempting that were, were, weren't quite frankly very good. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm proud. And I did want to just say one anecdote. Uh, Mike Spivey is a neighbor of mine on Sunnybrook and he I think came before you all and he was raving about the feedback that he received and how you took his design and actually made it better. And so I think that is really, really an important function for you all. And I just wanted to give that, that is my opinion but I think it's an important one and I, I just wanted to start there. <clears throat> so uh, Lau, can you pull up the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint? Please, sir. Lau? Do you all not see the PowerPoint? I can see the PowerPoint, it's on, it's on the screen. Okay. Oh, I cannot. I don't know. Like flip oh, back. Now I've got it. I had to hit it. I had to. Okay. Thank you, Lyle. Okay. So, guys, first of all, these are just some elements. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through what I did to this house. Okay. This house was the second large project of my career. I was business partners with Ridley Wills for 22 years. Um, and in fact, in 94, I had been working with him for about a year. And this was was the addition on the left <clears throat> was sort of my first large project. So let's just go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is the original, this was the original design by Pugin. And you see on either both the left and right side of the house <clears throat> were two very short, uh, two very narrow um, wings both of which have been de demolished. However, in 94, the wing on the left side existed. Um, <clears throat> you also see the garage that was off the back, okay? So would you go to the next slide, please? Right off the bat, guys, if you look at this house, first off, the, the approach to the house, and Gavin, I don't know whether you had a hand in this particular design, but the entire approach was changed somewhere around 2000 and all that hardscape in front is different and not original to the house. But the, the, the first thing that jumps off the page is the two front doors. Those front doors were made by Craig Dooley in about 1994 and they are not original to the house. The hardware on those doors is, is a, I could order from Home Depot. Um, it's Baldwin hardware. It's, it's good hardware. It's nothing to shake a stick at, but it is not original hardware. Um, and that was replaced. I don't know if we did the front doors in 94 or if it was a, one of our subsequent renovations. You'll also notice that the shutters are gone on the upper windows. And there were two hanging light fixtures from the front, uh, which I'll show you in a minute on a close-up, we added those lamps beside the front doors. Those are not original to the house. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> this was my addition. I did this, Ridley and I did this, and you all got it right. I read your, um, your opposition to the demolition of this project. This was designed by Bim Glasgow, okay? 
All of it is new construction. And I will note that in 94, we did take an effort to, to preserve the house in 94. And in fact, we robbed asbestos shingles off the back garage and used them on this front addition to preserve the aesthetic and, and keep it sort of in keeping with the rest of the house. <clears throat> All of that work, including the cornice and every bit of the rest of it was ripped off the house sometime after 2007 when I wasn't on the job anymore. But I can tell you, none of these windows are original. They're Nashville sash windows, um, very, very readily available and, and you can find them all over Brentwood uh, in any subdivision you walk into. Um, including the octagonal window. That is not the original window. And I'll show you on the other side, we, we removed the, uh, <clears throat> the Keeble octagonal window for window treatments. But let's go to the next slide, please. So over here, you can see this was the Keeble edition. Um, well, and you can see the original with the Keeble edition. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. I may have to come back. Okay, and then, so I'll give you an overview. I'm just gonna keep going through on an overview. This is what Ramsey did this, Jay Ramsey did this in about 2007. And he ripped off the garage and he also ripped off the Edwin Keeble edition. You can see that the roof line, if you look on the uh, upper right side of the house, the roof line is completely different and altered where they added that volume in there. The shed dormer, there's nothing about the shed dormer that existed anywhere on the house. <clears throat> and again, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a fairly generic design. Um, and it was really, and I can tell you unequivocally that it was all to meet the growing needs of a, a six person family. Um, they were seeking volume and, and, and really by this time in the history of the house, they were done trying to preserve any, any integrity, and I'll get to that in a second. They just needed size and volume, okay? But again, you see, see, the, uh, <clears throat> see the addition there. Um, all of the Pugin, all of the Pugin design on both sides of the house is now gone by this time. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So if you look at these columns, now I did these columns Again, his, through, for, I'm going to give you the history of the house from 94. So in 94, we did the addition. And then we started doing other projects. Ridley and I used to tell our clients, you know, uh, we'll renovate your house, but I mean, it's still an old house. And so we had a maintenance company that took care of all the needs. And so the columns were completely rotten on the house. We, we tore them off. You'll see that these are plastic column bases. Uh, in fact, I know that we bought those at Nashville Sash and Door. Once again, the columns are replacement columns. There's nothing historical about them. In fact, they are in need of replacement as it stands right now. The caps up at the top of the columns are, are um, <clears throat> again, plastic and, uh, you know, not original. And then I, I wanted, I thought it was important to note, if you look at the details of the, um, of, of Pugin's columns that he designed, these don't match that at all, okay? So again, at this point in the Briggs' ownership of the house, they've abandoned trying to be historically accurate. Again, they have four kids and they need a lot of square footage, okay? And also, and we'll get into it a little bit further, but the, the cornice on the entire house was, was removed, okay? So let's go to the next slide if we could, please. Again, here are some, you see the columns again. And if you look in the background, and Ron, this will stick out to you, I believe. If you look at the shutter hardware on the shutters, that is stamped steel, readily available. Um, you can buy that at Home Depot. You can buy that at, uh, well, not Nashville Sash any longer. They're gone, but, but I guess Sinwood, wherever. And then the shutter dog, same deal, stamped steel. Now this house, were it sort of, if it had been preserved, it would have cast iron shutter latches, more than likely not shutter dogs, and it would have the big cast iron hinges. Um, 
all of that is gone. In fact, if you walked up to the house and touched the shutters, you would see that they are in fact, probably an inch and an eighth shutter. Uh, again, uh, uh, just, a, just a shop grade. I mean, these are builder grade shutters that you would have on any, in any subdivision in Brentwood, uh, you would have these type shutters. There's nothing historical. They don't match the original plan. And, um, you know, there's, there's nothing significant about the shutters. Um, again, and, it, and could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, either that one's backwards or keep going, please. Okay, so here is the Keeble edition. Now, unfortunately, and I don't want everybody to get mad at me, we worked for our clients. We didn't do what we wanted to do, what we did what our clients wanted. The Keeble edition, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in an anecdote right now. When Russell called me to see if I knew anything about this house um, and, and what my opinion was, my immediate opinion was it was a perfectly great house to tear down. Um, and I'm, when I'm done, I think you'll agree. But, but one of the things that I was concerned about, he told me that this edition was a Keeble edition. I said, well, I need to call Ridley, okay? And I'm not talking about Ridley Wills II, who you all have quoted. I'm talking about Ridley Wills III, my business partner for 20 something years. <clears throat> and I just need to get his opinion. So I called him and I said, Ridley, do you, did you know that that was a, a Keeble edition on the, uh, on the side of the Briggs house? And, 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 and the first words out of his mouth were, well, it was a bad one, okay? So, and, and, he, and I'll, I'll get to why in just a minute, but every element of this Keeble edition, and I mean every element of this Keeble edition is gone. Okay, forcing, handcuffing our clients to preserve it because of this addition is not reasonable. But I'll show you why, and I, and, I, and I certainly welcome a debate, and I would love to answer your questions when I'm done. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so Josie McCarthy was hired by the Briggs in about, I would say, probably about 98, okay? Again, we did a renovation in 94. They lived with it, they had growing needs, and they met Josie McCarthy from Dallas, Texas. She was an interior designer. If you'll notice these, and, 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 and again, the reason I bring that up is from that moment on, the historical significant of this, significance of this house, getting rid of it became her job number one. And I know this because I worked with her for a number of years dismantling every historical detail in this house. We'll start with the bay windows. And again, and I, I keep referring to Ron just because I know he's an architect and these kinds of things jump off the page, but I'm sure they do to everyone. So I'm not trying to single anybody out or leave anybody out. But if you notice the bay windows on this edition were these very gently arched bays and they had you know five uh, vertical windows that were laid out in an arch pattern with a little copper eyebrow roof on them. <clears throat> there was one upstairs in the bedroom above. <clears throat> and when Josie got there, we ripped those off. Um, they didn't work for what she wanted to do inside the house. So again, just, just think about that. They didn't work for what she wanted to do inside the house, okay? So historical architecture, preserving beauty, was not her thing. It was never her thing, okay? So we ripped them off and we put these box bays on the downstairs floor. And then you see up above, we ripped the ones out and put those four windows on the side of the house. And then you can see even later, the screen porch addition, which completely covered up any detail that, that Keeble had on the back of the house. So at this point in time, Every window in the Keeble edition and every door in the Keeble edition on the outside is gone and you can't see it, okay? And I personally think that's important. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's another picture of the bays, the two box bays um, on the downstairs. And um, 
again, we're going to get to the cornice in a minute, but let's keep going. We can go to the next slide. Again, you're just seeing that these are, okay, now we move inside. Now this is really, again, I'm working for the client, so please don't shoot the messenger. But at this point, the inside, Keeble had put some butternut paneling, okay? The entire room was this beautiful butternut paneling. It had this huge butternut crown molding, butternut mantle around the fireplace, butternut doors. It had butternut exterior doors. The window sashes were butternut, okay? So it was this beautiful, if there was anything significant, it was probably the interior of this addition. Now let's go to the next slide. We gutted it all. In fact, I can tell you where the butternut is. It's, in, it's, it's down in Fairview on Brush Creek Road at a man named Fred Arrington's house. He came and demolished all the butternut on his own time because he thought it was so pretty and wanted to save it. But Josie McCarthy and Francis Briggs did not want to save it. You'll see we added a mantle, a stone mantle inside um, with a, she had a little signature deal in the fireplace. That is not original. That is Josie McCarthy, Dallas, Texas design. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> you can see these, these doors, okay? These doors were ha had to be lowered in the room so that we could get the soffit for air conditioning above. Uh, if you look where that bar is on the, on the right picture, that is laminate hardwood floor. That is glue down because we had to glue down on the concrete floor hardwood, and that is why there's carpet in there. There was tile in that room originally. There is no more tile left. In fact, just while we're on it, there is no original tile left in this house, and I have walked through every inch of it, and I am certain of that. There is no original hardware left in this house. It is all replacement Baldwin hardware that is, re I could go to Home Depot and special order the hardware at this point in time. And in fact, the doors have all been replaced. And if you were to look at the plans, you would see that the plans show a, a door, a three panel door with a small panel at the top. Then the middle panel is the largest panel. And then the bottom panel is smaller. <clears throat> And I went through the house kind of surprised because this work was done by Ramsey when he did the addition. That door there is readily available. That is actually an exterior door that you can use inside. It's an inch and three eighths thick door. That was used throughout the house and it is a replacement door, not the original door, okay? So just again, these are details that I am 100% certain of. Let's go to the next slide. There it is again. So if you could see what that, that view looked like with the butternut, it was, it was actually pretty. And with the, with the little bay windows that were just these little soft arches, elliptical arches. I don't know, I don't know the right shape, but anyway, that's not there any longer. Let's go to the next slide. Somehow we're getting some repeats. Keep going, please. I think we're going backwards. Okay. Yeah, we're going backwards. There's the mantle again. Keep going, please. Okay, this is in the living room. You see these columns on this exterior wall? Not original. I looked at all the hardware on these doors. Um, it is all Baldwin um, and it is no longer original. And, and in fact, I did not replace that. That was done by Ramsey, but I do know because I repaired some of the old hardware that, uh, that, that it's been replaced. But these two columns shown on the right, excuse me, on the left side, those were simply added. Those are nothing historic, nothing significant. They were added to cover the plumbing uh, for the upstairs bathroom with the, the addition we did in 1994. Um, let's continue, please. 
So now we're to the front of the house. If you look here, you can see the patchwork done where the light is on the left picture. And um, again, that is not original to the house. What was original to the house is were these, these fixtures that hung from the porch ceiling, which I also replaced in 19, uh, probably 2000. Uh, it is no longer the original porch ceiling, just again, just to, to, to clarify. And that again is with readily available. That is not, we did not match the bead board that was up there. We put what was readily available. But you see these light fixtures um, and, and you can see the patchwork done. Those were an add-on. And again, for any of you who have, have ever fooled with shutters, you can see these stamped steel uh, S-shaped shutter dogs that, uh, I mean, I could bend in my hand. I mean, they're, they're just, they're not, they're not anything, they're not even a good replica of something from, from back then. Um, so <clears throat> let's continue, please. Now I wanted to show this slide because I was, I was very careful. I didn't want to make a claim that I couldn't back up. But the cornice on this house, and I can tell you I've walked around the entire house, is completely, it's been gutted and removed. None of it is original. The design is not even original. Um, you can see that the continuous eave vent was added to, um, to, to, to the entire cornice. And uh, it is, if you can look closely at that lower corner where the gutter is attached below it, there's a dark line. That is a continuous aluminum eave vent that probably didn't start getting used uh, on houses until I would say <clears throat> probably the seventies at the earliest. But you also see the baseboard that was added. The baseboard was added because the, 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 the fascia board was, uh, probably it, it, when it was built, it was probably 14 inches. And then of course you can't get that material. And in order to cover up the brick properly, they had to come up with a, um, you know, a solution. So they added that piece of upside down base that the, uh, the, the dental blocks are attached to. Now, I tell you all this because if I were hired as I was to work on Bellmead Plantation, Traveler's Rest, Old Town, and Meeting of the Waters, all those homes are on the historic register. If I were hired by them and I was asked to do some work on the cornice, I would have made sure that I acquired a 14 inch board and did it the way that it was done originally. I would have also probably come up with a more uh, appropriate way to vent the roof than the continuous aluminum strip vent that was used when they put this new roof on the house. Uh, and that was after my time, so it was probably in 07. <clears throat> but as you can see, the, the, the cornice work is <laughs> bears no resemblance to what was, was done when it was a Pugin house, okay? So let's continue on, please. Now, I, I, I think I read your, your, uh, your opposition to the demolition of this project. And I, and I did know, I, I saw that you all did in fact figure out the, uh, that, that I was not Edwin Keeble. Um, and I'm glad because I did that addition and you did get it right. Bim Glasgow was the architect. Um, so uh, that is not, the Keeble edition was on the back of the house and, and it looked like based on, and I don't know, did everybody on the committee get a chance to read the opposition to the demolition before this meeting? Or, cause I'll, I'll happily show you where the Keeble edition was on the left if anybody needs me to. Yeah, show me where it is. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. It is not there. And that is not the Keeble edition. That is my edition and Bim Glasgow's edition. Okay, so this is where 
the Keeble edition was close to this. Obviously, this was done by Ramsey in 2007. <clears throat> um, here's where the Keeble edition was. So the three garages there on the upper slide, that's Pugin's original design. And what Keeble did was he added the, uh, the, the guest quarters, if you want to call it guest quarters. I, I'm not sure you're supposed to say servants quarters these days. Um, <laughs> he added the, the guest quarters to, that, to this house. And I can tell you that that was a favor. He was doing someone a favor because if Edwin Keeble knew that we were discussing this particular edition, he would probably not be thrilled. Um, it had a very unique uh, a floating concrete little walkway and a little step to the door. And the, the most notable thing that I liked about his addition here was on the left side, the, the, the door down there. When I renovated it in 2000, excuse me, in 94, I took that door out and put a pair of metal doors in so that they could keep their lawn equipment there. And they actually moved their groundskeeper into this apartment. The apartment had teardrop millwork. It, it had a two burner little uh, oven top and it was um, <clears throat> nothing significant. And it's a good thing it got torn down. It was really a mess. Um, it was really a mess. So anyway, that is the, the, the left side Keeble edition. Um, so let's check the next slide. So this is what the client wants to, say, to build. Now, before we get to that, I just wanna say this, in, in sort of in closing. I restored houses in Bellmead really for my whole career. Um, I, I, I worked on historic homes. I worked on homes that were on the historic register. Handcuffing our clients to this house, you are handcuffing them to something that has been systematically, the historic value has been systematically gutted from it since Josie McCarthy came on the scene circa 1998, 2000. I don't know the exact date, so don't, don't hold me to that. But when she came, I mean, she was like, get rid of the box locks, get rid of the hardware. We want Baldwin, order Baldwin, we want all new. Get rid of the tile. Like we had preserved some things about that house and it was her mission to dismantle it all. And I also wanna just note this because these are reasons houses are put on historic register and reasons they are kept off. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I, renovated this house in 1994. I maintained and did small renovations from that point until 2007. And I helped maintain that house after 2007, okay? Because Ridley and I did run a, a handyman and maintenance company and the Briggs were always long-term clients even though they didn't hire us for all the big projects. So I did work, Bim Glasgow did work. Um, I don't even know the architect that did the Ramsey edition. But I do know that there was another project where Will Andrews was hired to do some windows. That was before they hired Ramsey. And Will Andrews did window work. And, 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 and then they hired Ramsey to do the big addition. So we've got three or four contractors on the project. We've got multiple architects. And we have an interior designer who basically wanted everything that was old and charming about the house gutted from the house. And I can tell you that I could take you through that house and I could walk into any subdivision in Brentwood and show you elements of, of the Briggs's former house that exist in every you know, subdivision in Brentwood. There's nothing, nothing historical about it except the front facade, which you all claim and then I would say that the shutters are no longer, the columns are no longer, the windows are no longer. Um, and I just, I don't understand, uh, I don't understand what you would be preserving, quite frankly. Columns from 1994. Can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. Um, how Wendell, it's Bunny. Hey, Bunny. Um, 
Okay, so these are a few questions that I have. Uh, one, that makes a little sense because those additions, I was thinking that Edwin Keeble probably would not have designed anything like that. They were quite unattractive. The second thing is- Ridley agrees with you. Uh, the main body of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, has the main, the, is the entry hall staircase the original staircase? The stairs are original and they're not code legal. And then the that's, balustrade, okay, I'm sorry. Go the ahead. balustrade okay. was not code legal and we had to modify it in order to bring it into code. So it is not original. But the and staircase, this, uh, what about the wood floors in the entry hall in the main part of the house? Are they original? I believe, I, I do believe that the there is in the main entry and only in the main entry, not in the dining room, the kitchen sort of sitting area, or either of the two, the living room or the library in front. But in the main entry, I, th I believe the floors might be- the, the, the hardwood floors in the living room were replaced? Yes, they're strip floors. I believe they're uh, two and a quarter inch strip floors, yes. What about um, the windows in the main part of the house? Are they the original windows? They um, looked it on I, the picture. Okay, I didn't do an audit of all the windows in the entire house. I do know for a fact that some of the double hung windows on the front of the house are replacement double hung windows. And in fact, some even were replaced by me with ropes and they are new windows. There are a lot of windows that are double hung windows that have vinyl tracks on them. Okay, in, in the main, main part of the in, in the main, in part, the main part, part, yes, yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, particularly in the upstairs bathroom, I believe, uh, that looks out over the front porch. Okay. And uh, the columns and the shutters, I mean, that's just maintenance. Those things have to be replaced. So I don't think that's a big deal, but um, I was just curious about those other things. Thank you. Well, it's, I think, but Bunny, I do believe it's important to, to note that if, if we're going to handcuff them to preserving the house, they are being, it's not like we are preserving columns that were from 1937. We are preserving Nashville sash finger joint columns circa 1998. Wendell, this is Rocky. Can you explain when you did the replacement of the columns, was there any effort to replace the columns with the same design of Pugin in the original drawings or are those stock columns that those are stock columns and that's the point and I'm glad you asked that question. So when I worked at Bellmead Plantation on several, not major projects, small projects, at Traveler's Rest on several small projects, we would match identically what was there. And that in my view is when you're restoring something. We bought for those columns what was readily available. So you have two choices. You go and match identically what is there. That's a commitment to sort of preserving the beauty of the house, or you just buy what's readily available. And again, I'm, 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 don't shoot the messenger, but at every turn, what we did was buy what was readily available. And is that because your clients just wanted it cheap? I'm just trying to figure out who did the plans in 1994 you know, if, the, if there are plans that when you did the renovation 94, they would clearly outline what was changed. Okay, Jeanette, great question. So the plans in 94 should be on file at Bellmead and BIM Glasgow did them. I did place a call to BIM and actually we, we, ne we never got in touch with each other because I was going to see if he by chance had them and I would pretty much bet he doesn't. The, the best hope would be if Bellmead had them on file. And I know we filed them with Terry Franklin when we did the project, but the, but the, so, so here's, this is important for everybody to understand. In 1994, we did that addition on the left. At that point, we didn't gut all the doors. We didn't gut all the tile work in the house. We put a little kitchen addition on the side of the house, et cetera. We actually went, took time to use roofing from the back garage so that it, it matched the house. So there was an effort in 94 to, to, to pay homage to the structure. When Josie McCarthy was hired, it was 
I mean, and I and she was in your face about it. Like she was determined, get rid of this old junk. This is crap. Why would we use this? And I and I and I mean that sincerely. And so their approach to the house, and Josie has a very strong personality. Their approach to the house, and 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 you know, she was a professional that they trusted, was to basically gut any historic significance of the house. And I'm talking about every inch of tile work in that house. There's no original tile work. I'm talking about every inch of hardware in that house. There is no original hardware, not one, not one piece. Um, and, and so obviously the, the butternut paneling, um, that was a decision. So I don't know why they did it, Jeanette, money or just, I think it was sort of an attitude of wanting it nice and new. Um, and that was driven by Josie McCarthy. So there are no plans that we have right now while in our files that show anything that has been um, submitted to Bell Mead for either the 1994 edition, the 2007 editions, or in between that show the structural changes. Because there's just been a, you know, a lot of different people who've seen the house over the years but it would be helpful if there were plans that were filed to be able to compare and show the different parts that were taken down of the historic structure. And, and I agree with you, you know, a lot of these pieces and parts, um, it's unfortunate that either builders use cheap Home Depot or a client to me rarely requests that, um, but it would, it would be helpful to me if there were plans that were filed that we could review. Lyle, has anybody come uh, up with Nobody those? has, I don't think anyone has approached me. I could be wrong. This has been going on a while to, to actually try and find plans. I'm actually looking now Okay. if I have anything in the database. Hey, Lyle, this is Rocky. We, we came over to your office and asked for, for everything and we couldn't find it. I remember you told me that there was a garage with drawings and, and I have resisted. I see Kim shaking his head. I think I resisted your invitation to wade through the garage at the in some kind of eve of there of all these old drawings that aren't necessarily in yet. Um, and I can turn my video back on. I'm no longer educating my children who were in the room next door to me, um, who were just in here. So um, we haven't found those things and we have looked uh, for them. And Rocky, uh, as you'll recall, I talked to Jay Ramsey yeah. and he talked to his father and brother, Larry, that both had done a lot of work and they looked in their files. He wasn't sure they had it and he couldn't find it. And this was after Lyle told me that there were no plans available at Bell Mead, so I don't know. And I, but I would make I would make this offer. Um, am I on? Can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I would make this offer. I can walk anyone who would like to take the time through that house, and I can show you. Like I, I and and again, I'm going to give you a little more history of the house. Like I said, I started in '94 working on that house. We had a maintenance and repair company. Francis and her sister Stephanie, they they hired me to do all types of maintenance on the, their houses for for years. So mm -hmm. even after Ramsey came along, after Will Andrews had done some work out there, I was still doing work at their house. I, I am very very familiar with this property. So I can show you guys firsthand. And you can touch and feel and see what I'm talking about if anyone would like to do that or if that would help. Russell, you're on mute. Still on mute. Russell, you're muted. Nope, you went back on mute, Russell. Now I'm on. Now yes. you're on. Wendell, would it be worth mentioning the basement situation in? Well, thank you, Russell, for that. Um, again, I, I, 
I, again, I don't want, I don't take this, this recommendation lightly. Okay. And, and again, my recommendation is that you allow uh, uh, your resident to tear this house down and, and build the house that they want to build. But I, again, going into the structural integrity of the house. Okay. We added on to the house, if you recall, on the left side. When you do that, you really need to tie the footings together. Well, in order to do that, you have to excavate down to the footings where you're, where you're going to tie them together. And in doing so, it was discovered, which is very common at the time, that the house doesn't have any footings. It was dug down to undisturbed soil and they started laying their foundation right there. Um, well, that's important because I have done at Traveler's Rest, for example, I have been hired and had to engineer a solution on to, to deal with that exact issue there, obviously a much older home. But so even in the 30s, I guess, when this house was built, that was still a practice. Um, so if I were had invested the type of money that these folks have invested and then were asked to preserve this structure, that is again, and 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 uh, Jeanette, I, I want to make sure I use the the analogy of Home Depot because I could go to Home Depot and buy that stuff. It is not like the cheapest junk from Home Depot. Okay, so I don't want I don't want you all to think that that's my claim. It is Baldwin brass. It's it's good hardware, but it is very readily available. <clears throat> but anyway, if they're tasked with salvaging all this stuff and restoring it. And then you're putting it on a foundation that isn't really optimal. Okay. Are there old houses all over Belmead that have this exact detail? Yes, I've worked on plenty of them. But again, if I'm going to invest this kind of money, I think that it's especially on a house that's not got any real historical significance left in it. I mean, all the details are gone. Um, I, I think it would be overly burdensome, quite frankly. Well, I appreciate all the information you've given us today. Um, this committee is really tasked with evaluating all the information that's brought to us. And the reason we're here for a third time is that we did have inadequate information given to us to consider this. And that burden is on the proponent, the, the homeowner. So that's why we are having a third hearing today. And I do appreciate all the information that you've given us today as far as the history and the actual integrity of the building, of the materials used in the building. Well, you're welcome. Again, I would happily guide anyone through the house. Um, so, Bunny, have you got any questions? You answered. Thank you, Wendell. Wendell, thank you very much for uh, giving us a thorough walk through that was very helpful to see how that some things did not quite match up to the drawings and even on the columns you could say some of the bases did not match as well and that would be uh, all so, of the bases, Gavin. that's all yeah. so it is very helpful to, to hear uh, uh just a, a construction history and sort of a maintenance history thank you you're welcome um Kim, uh, do you or uh, Chris want to speak for or against uh, what we've heard today? Well, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I know Chris has put together some images that we wanted to show. I want to thank Wendell for his uh, de uh, description of the evolution of the house because he's absolutely right. We were in error. We thought that the left side addition was by Edwin Keeble. It's not. It was done in 1994 by in Glasgow. By the way, I've known Ben forever. So I called him. I said, you know, did you work on this? Do you have any drawings? He said, no, I don't. He didn't even remember it. But I think what uh, Wendell has shown is 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 accurate about the uh, particularly project that he was involved in in 1994. And obviously, it was very insensitive uh, to an historic home, but he was not done what he was asked to do by the client. I, I, my initial reaction is that Josie uh, whatever her last name McCarthy. is, is equivalent of an aesthetic termite. <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, I'm going to turn Kim, over Kim, to I've got to interrupt you real quick. I'm sorry. Ridley, and you know Ridley, I'm sure. You're on your... My Ridley, yes. Yeah, the, you're... Ridley and Josie did not like each other at all, if you can believe that. <laughs> well, 
you know, obviously we've, we've learned, I think as a group, we've learned a lot about this house and I think it comes down to a couple of things. Uh, whether Pugin was a notable architect and whether the house has historic significance. So Chris, I'd like you to uh, go through a couple of items and these are updates on our earlier presentation, which had errors in it. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Lyle, if you could uh, put our slides up um, and I'm glad Rocky, you and your group were able to see this uh, prior um, to this meeting. Um, I think that's good. And yeah, to Kim's point, um, you know, our, our last presentation um, had a few errors in it and it was never our intention to provide misleading information. Um, you know, when we, when we saw the, the letter in response to our last presentation, it brought some new things to light that we started to, to dig in on a little bit further. Um, and that was very helpful. And Wendell, definitely your presentation that you just went through was extremely uh, enlightening. Um, that's helpful to see kind of a point by point walkthrough um, because, uh, you know, Kim and I have not stepped foot on the property. Um, you know, we were very careful not to do that. And we were trying to work off as much of the information and imagery that we had available to us. So thank you for that. And that was extremely helpful. Um, you know, I will note that if nothing else, um, this has been a lot of fun actually digging into um, Pugin's work because I, I'll admit, you know, me personally, I did not know a lot about uh, Welby Pugin going into this and uh, have learned a lot along the way and have gotten a lot of feedback from, from Kim and uh, Carol Van West and uh, Tim, uh, Tim Walker, you know, a lot of people who knew of Welby Pugin and spoke very highly of him. Um, so, I mean, honestly, it's just been a lot of fun for me personally to dig into the history. Um, you know, we did kind of want to go through a few slides here quickly. Um, the first point that we would like to make is that, you know, through our research, we do feel um, that Mr. Pugin was a notable architect of his time. Um, the, and we'd like to go through a couple of his works, which we presented last time, but the first one being Sherwood Forest. And Rocky, I, I really appreciate you clarifying this point, um, the fact that um, Sherwood Forest actually is not demolished um, and is still standing today. Um, in fact, those two photos that you see in the middle there are um, just from earlier this week that were taken of the existing structure. Um, but, you know, Sherwood Forest is one of Mr. Pugin's most notable works. Um, it was actually finished roughly uh, around the same time as Cheekwood, um, come to find out. And, you know, in speaking with uh, um, Carol Van, Van West, uh, he noted that, and I'm just going to read this quote verbatim um, from him, uh, Newman Newman Cheek Sherwood Forest, designed by Welby Pugin and finished at roughly the same time as Cheekwood, was obviously considered an equal to Cheekwood, one of the city's most important buildings of the decade, um, as evidence in its inclusion in the WPA guide published in 1939. Um, you know, I, I thought that was a pretty, uh, pretty accurate statement and notable um, in the sense that it proves that uh, Mr. Pugin was a notable architect and, and had some pretty spectacular works of his time. Um, you know, while there may not be a tremendous amount of them um, and some of them not on the historic register, um, he did do some very nice projects. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and we showed this one last time. This is the Saunders Payne uh, home in Mississippi. Um, and it was noted in the rebuttal letter to our last presentation um, that Mr. Pugin did not design this. And, you know, it was, I don't believe we ever made um, the statement that he did design the original home. Uh, what we did say was that he did um, an addition and renovation to this home and that that was mentioned in the historic register, um, not that he himself was, um, design the original home that was on the historic register. But I think we did want to point out um, a statement from the historic registry that says, uh, Welby and Pugin's more notable early residences include those of E.B. Stevens Jr. 
um, which was the uh, Stevens home um, at 1220. Um, and so, and also mentioned the Newman Cheek home in Nashville. So those were both specifically listed in the National Historic Register for um, this property. And uh, Mr. Pugin is, is listed throughout all of the um, information that is handed out as part of the Saunders Payne home. But I did want to specifically note, um, you know, it is correct. All he did a renovation and an addition to this property. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So the next slide uh, shows uh, Ingleham, uh, which is the Vernon Sharp home, um, also a home which was restored uh, by Mr. Pugin. Um, which he was the architect in 1938, uh, just prior to uh, when 1220 was constructed. I will note that this property, um, we never made the assertion that this one was on the National Historic Register. What we said previously was that this was um, on the Tennessee Historical Commission site and the Williamson County Historic Property Survey. Um, but I will also note that um, in conversations with Mr. Van West, uh, he did note um, that in 1939, Mr. Pugin also renovated for Vernon Sharp, the home known as Ingleham in 1939, and perhaps that Colonial Revival Commission influenced his next major country home design, the property at 1220 Chickering Road, also completed in 1939. Unlike the English Gothic of Sherwood Forest, Pugin chose a graceful Colonial Revival design as certainly the Colonial Revival took hold of the South in the wake of the success of the renovation of Colonial Williamsburg, also in the 1930s. The delicacy of the Colonial Revival inspired entrance remains impressive today and the historic interior as documented in photos in which he looked at uh, in the real estate listing on Redfin is as graceful as the entrance. So that was a quote from uh, Carol Van West. Um, if you could go to the next slide please um can i point can i point out one thing those quotes are coming certainly. from the tennessee uh the distinguished carol van west who is the tennessee uh historian he is he is our state's historian okay back to you chris yes that's correct thank you for clarifying that kim i appreciate that um we did want to go through a few slides um of the home um, which we, we won't belabor because I know uh, Wendell just went through all of this, but we did want to, what you see highlighted in green is the, um, the original portion of 1220 designed by Mr. Pugin. Um, and, you know, while there are some of the details that have changed, and again, Wendell, I appreciate you pointing that out, that the columns were reconstructed, the shutters, et cetera, um, we still feel like the character um, that you see in the original elevation by Mr. Pugin um, still exists today and is still prominent from uh, Chickering Road. Um, so, you know, while each detail may not be intact, we think the overall character of his design um, is still very much intact. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, as it was pointed out, um, you are correct. There was an error in our last presentation. Um, it's been somewhat of a puzzle trying to figure all of this out. Um, and, you know, I think it was Rocky that mentioned digging in the history is, is challenging, um, trying to find all of this information. But what we have highlighted in sort of that orangish yellow color um, that you see there on the right, I'll just note it as right and left hand side. Um, on the right hand side, that orange uh, dash line marks uh, the original Edwin Keeble edition in 1962. And what, after digging in when we saw the last letter, um, the garage edition, um, which they are correct, occurred to the backside of the original Pugin structure, which was uh, a, it's called a maid's quarter, servant's quarter, um, that was to the back of the original garage. What I've noted in blue is the left edition, which we um, in error claimed last time was a, a Keeble edition. Um, and I think we were in error and we'll show you in a minute um, because of how similar those elevations looked um, to one another um, that you know, we made the claim that Keeble did that. Um, in fact, at the time, right before this presentation, we were still unsure who did that left edition. So today has kind of shed some light on that. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. 
So this shows the 1962 Keeble Garage Edition, um, which has been noted was demolished. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So just highlighting the portion um, from what we could tell that was removed um, and showing uh, a photo from the real estate listing uh, of the back of the property, which you can see um, was that 94 and sounds like a subsequent addition in the 2000s um, after that as well. Next slide, please. So this is the what I'm calling the right side or what I think in all the, the letters back and forth have listed as the right side. Um, 1962 Edwin Keeble edition. So you can see uh, in the elevations in the bottom right, uh, which Wendell shared in his presentation as well. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? I think this will read a little bit better there. So you can see that that right edition, um, while it was a Keeble edition, um, has been altered. You know, the octagonal window, window that was shown uh, in that bottom elevation has clearly been changed out to a square window. Um, the bays on the right hand side of the house have been altered um, from their original state, but you know, the, the character of the Keeble edition or the roof line, et cetera, is still there um, today, but you, you know, Wendell's correct. They have been altered slightly over time. And then if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is the left edition, um, which we did, as Kim noted, reached out to Bim because um, we kind of had a, a feeling that he may have done this edition on the left-hand side. But um, as Kim mentioned, he, um, Bim didn't have any drawings, uh, couldn't find any drawings of that. Um, what we thought was the 94 um, edition. And uh, he, in fact, didn't even remember doing this edition. So, but I think the reason we were in error previously saying that this was a Keeble edition, if you look at the elevation on the bottom, um, the bottom image there, it is a perfect mirror of what Edwin Keeble had designed. Um, it has the octagonal window uh, in the same location. Uh, the shape of the roof is exactly the same. Um, the windows on the second story are in the exact same spot. Um, so, you know, kudos to you, Wendell, and everyone else that was involved. Um, I mean, it's a dead ringer and an exact replica of what Keeble um, had in his original elevations, just mirrored on the left-hand side of the house. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. With this, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Well, listen, folks, you know, of course, this we have really uh, gotten down in the weeds on a lot of details of what happened at different times. I'm not an attorney. I'm an architect, and it is the house beyond saving. Uh, I would think it's not beyond savings. Uh, by the way, it's mentioned to everybody, keep drawings of your projects. <laughs> Put them in the safe deposit box or whatever. So this happens, um, you know, it, we believe that Pugin was indeed a notable architect. I'm not going to read all this stuff because we've taken a lot of your time. Uh, and of course, Keeble was a notable, was extremely notable architect. The house is not perfect, but we believe it should not be destroyed. Uh, we recognize that, that the house and expanding it would be a challenge. It would be a challenge. I, I'm, I'm sure Wendell could do a great expansion or another architect or another builder could do that. Uh, Ridley Wills, of course, had commented that uh, Ridley Wills, the elder, who's probably one of our treasures in our city and our area made a pretty strong statement that tearing the house down would not be a good idea. Next slide. Can, oh, well, uh, Kim, could I just say one thing on that, please? Yes. <clears throat> I, I, with all due respect, I have known Ridley and Ridley the second my entire life. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Ridley Wills II were going to make a, give a true opinion of a house and its condition for preservation or removal, the two people on this earth that he would summon their opinion would be Ridley Wills III and Wendell Dudley Harmer, okay? <laughs> and I can tell you that for a fact. <laughs> So if he were to, to really be put on the spot versus a sort of impassing statement, the two people he would turn to are his son and me. 
So I just wanted that to be uh, on the record because that is a fact. Okay, so noted. Uh, next slide, please. This is from Carol Van West. Again, I'm not gonna read this, but Carol Van West is the state historian. And he's taken a pretty strong stance on this about Welby Hugens, uh, that he is a noted architect, uh, that the owners decided a year after Pugin's death in 62 to hire the contemporary architect Edwin Keebel to do the addition. What basically Carol Van West says is that these changes, that the addition was quite restrained. Uh, Keebel could do all kinds of stylistic adoptions and he, and his addition to the right side is noted. Uh, basically he says, Carol Van West says at the bottom, you know, Pugin well, is an architect of merit. It would be sad to see this Second major country home uh, commission passed away. And then this is noted in an article that appeared when the house was featured in a summary of outstanding, outstanding creations of leading Southern architects. You know, he's noted. Next slide. Yeah, this is a long, basically from George and uh, Pat uh, the neighbors next door, kind of a response to all the things that were in the letter and also a request that the house not be demolished. So I want to read very quickly something that showed up just like 20 minutes before our presentation. And this is from Tim Walker. Tim, I'm be glad to send you the email on this. Uh, these are his words. Tim Walker is the executive director of the uh, Metro Historical Commission. Okay, these are his words, board members, 1220, Chickering Road is a national register eligible property that was designed by Webby Pugin in 1939 with additions in the 1960s, Edwin Keeble, and in 1994. Welby Pugin and Edwin Keeble are noted national architects of the mid 20th century. Pugin is noted for the homes he designed in the fluid suburbs of Nashville, while Keeble is known not only for his high style residential designs, but also for his churches and commercial structures, LNC Tower and Vanderbilt's Memorial Gym. This structure contributes to the historic architectural character of Belmede and its demolition would be a loss to the city and its noted character as one of Nashville's significant early 20th century residential neighborhood developments. I hope you will deny the request for demolition and work with the applicant on the approval of an addition to the building that meets their needs. Sincerely, Tim Walker. I think when this whole thing started, you know, it was uh, the submission was that, you know, nobody important was involved in this house and it's not historic. And I think what we've shown is no, the, uh, you know, in, we are laying this at the feet of the uh, commission. Next slide, please. Very last one, sorry. Uh, you know, we're laying this at your feet. There's been a lot of research done. It's formed an interesting history. Uh, it's your decision. Thank you very much for listening and pondering the information and support that we've received from experts. Thank you. And, and may I ask, add one more thought to that, Kim, if I may? I, because I have you know, worked on several homes that were on the historic register. And I've worked on several projects that have been considered and denied uh, being on the historic register. And it is my recollection, and I claim not to be an expert on this, but when a structure has been modified and when the details are lost, a case in point are the bay windows and the octagonal window on the Keeble edition. <clears throat> if we had gone before them and said, we want to get this house on the historic registry, we would have been denied after this work had been done. And, and I, I know this simply because I've been denied. Um, and, and so I just want to make sure that I know someone has said it should be or could be, et cetera. But if they knew the history as I know it, and had the experience that I've had, I don't think it would be a candidate. 
And I think well, that's the uh, the uh, application process is up to you know experts that have to compile the information and make the make the uh, application to the historic sort of registry. I mean that's a that's a very complicated and endeavored thing, and we're not saying that the house would be uh, a candidate for it. I mean, uh, Tim Walker has said that he feels like it could be. Would require a lot of work and some careful work. Uh, I think that's the case. Uh, but that's, as I understand it, is not the issue that the House, we were, we were saying that the House, that a notable architect was involved in this historic house, and it's part of the fabric of Belmead, and therefore, even with its insensitive additions that may have occurred in 1994 and the original one that was done in 1960s, that the House still has very strong historic presence, presence on Chickering Road as part of the fabric of that neighborhood. Okay, I understand that, I, that's fair. Thank you. Is there anyone else in attendance who would like to speak or speak again? I say, Mr. Wall, this is Rocky. Sure. Uh, one, I can say as a third myself, I'm always kind of, uh, I gravitate to those towards those that have the Roman numeral three that follows their name. So I, I join with uh, Wendell's appreciation of Ridley three being a third myself. Uh, the one thing I wanted to conclude on, Lyle, we had sent to you Jonathan Tarot's uh, elevations because we wanted to flesh out more what we're requesting for the actual structure to be constructed on the parcel. Uh, Lyle, if you wouldn't mind um, bringing those up and as we take a quick look at those, I'll just succinctly include um, so this one uh, it should be Jonathan yeah let's start there so what we're asking for here is is an opportunity to engage in this project what you've heard a lot of is about the history of this structure we can have this debate on whether Pugin is a notable architect whether this home could be listed on the historic registry and Mr. Harmer makes an important and I think one that needs to be really hammered here is that when any national uh, registry application is being considered, you can't only take in consideration when it's constructed, who did what to it. You have to consider what's been done to it. And I heard Mr. Hinton acknowledge there's been a lot of insensitive additions done to this home. And frankly, there's been a lot of what Putin did undone to this home, especially with Mr. Keeble as well. So what they designed, frankly, is not there. And there's a lot of nostalgia that is being referenced here. And nostalgia is not history. Uh, this home sits on this hill. It's a beautiful lot. It's one of the most amazing lots in Belmede. And it's that lot that frames this home as we referenced earlier. And so these are some of the elevations that Mr. Tarot has done for the family to show you what we are seeking to collaborate with the city of Belmead to put on this parcel in replacement of the current structure there. If we could look at the next, next few, just so we can run through them. Um, these elevations, again, are, are a, a tip of the hat to the Dutch colonials that exist in the neighborhood already and are time appropriate. I made reference at our first hearing that we're not looking to build some sleek Malibu mansion here. The owners want to engage in this process. They've hired Mr. Road, Mr. Tarod, uh, who I think everyone has acknowledged is, is a great architect and drawer in his own right to work and collaborate with Bellamy. Can we go to the next slide, please? So again, these are just some of the elevations and Jonathan's done a good job to try to capture some of the vegetation that currently exists. Um, I, you know, the two trees that are there in the front that kind of frame up and, and really show the house. Can you look at the final one? So again, this is just the structure that we would like to collaborate with Belmead through the process if this demolition permit is granted. This shows you what we're looking to do here. Uh, we are trying to be sensitive to the history of Belmead, but we believe we have demonstrated that this property of significance um, doesn't satisfy the criteria to be a property of significance. And even if you did find that it was a property of significance, what was significant, frankly, has been stripped away through no fault of the owner. And importantly, and I think this can't be emphasized enough, through no fault of this owner. This is not the owner that did this to this home. This is an owner that purchased it, 
when there was no overlay was told that it was going to be a teardown, that members on this commission thought it was a teardown. And frankly, now because of its original core age, we have this pause moment in assessing whether it should be tore down because it was constructed in 1939 and Mr. Puja and Mr. Keeble had a hand in it. Frankly, it would be onerous, burdensome. You heard it from Mr. Harmer himself who could speak on this more so than I can to handcuff these owners uh, to this structure. Um, and for that reason, I'll, I'll conclude. If any of you all want to, Wendell has offered it. I imagine he's captivating here. He would be even more captivating as a tour guide. Um, if you want to walk this structure, we're more than happy to arrange it uh, in, in a COVID conscientious way. Uh, so people can you know, be comfortable knowing that the structure is not what was designed. It's not that it's not been preserved. And frankly, what we would add, what the owners would add, we believe would be more than a net benefit to Bellmead. We think it would increase its revenues through tax base. We think it would increase the aesthetics. We think that this would be a legacy home that people would talk about in the next hundred years of being on the registry because it is such a wonderful design. So I'll conclude on that. Wendell, if he wants to chime in any further, but that concludes our comments. <clears throat> No, I would I'd like to say one thing before uh, as an answer to what you were saying, uh, that it's not history, that the history has been removed so much. And, and yet we have the words of two prominent historians that disagree with that. And those well, are the Kim, experts. So, you know, that this is subjective. We recognize that it's subjective and that things have been done to the original house that are, that are perhaps unfortunate. But to say that all the history has been removed, I don't think that's true. And I don't think the historians that we have contacted for their evaluation, professional and you know, learned opinions, they certainly, they don't say that. So, you know, thank you for listening. Well, I would just like to ask a question, if I may, how many of those historians visited the site and walked through the house? I don't know. Okay. I think it's based on the information that's been readily available. And our task, or I guess our mission, was to do two things. Was to inquire about whether Pugin was a notable architect, and we believe he was. And the second item is, is the house still historically viable, even given the additional one side that Keeble did that has been altered slightly and the additional on the other side that was done in 1994. We acknowledge the presence of those, but to say that all of a sudden the Pugin original has kind of poof gone away and it's about to fall down or that the addition that Keeble made was ripped apart and changed dramatically. I just don't think that's the case. In fact, the addition done in 1994 is a very subdued, and I think that Bim Glasgow did a very good job of trying to balance and mirror what had been done earlier by Keeble, that, that octagonal window that, you know, that's kind of like, well, he obviously may have known something about the history of the house. Who knows? We've learned a lot about this, and but the information is submitted, and the historian's evaluation is submitted to this committee for their evaluation. My point about the historians is that I almost assure this committee, and I'll and Steve correct me or Kim correct me if I'm wrong, that they didn't have the information that Wendell just walked through. And again, it is subjective and it's a balancing act, and it's always tough. Can I interrupt just a second? Absolutely, Bunny. Y'all, we've been at this for an hour and a half, and I feel like we're beginning to repeat ourselves. I don't know if the rest of the commission feels that way, but there are other things for us to review today too. I feel like y'all are beginning to have arguments between the two of you. Um, if there's new information, I'm interested in hearing it, but if not, I just, I, I think that y'all are arguing a point that's not going to be settled here. It's your opinions. Well, we stand I think on I would concur with, uh, Bunny. Yeah, let's move on. Uh, if there's anyone else in attendance who would like to speak, please do so now. Otherwise, we're going to close the, uh, public portion and the board will do its deliberation. Okay, board, so ball's ours. Uh, Mal, this is Gavin. 
Yeah. Um, it seems to me that there's, um, I mean, there's not much left to the original intent or the uh, architecture that was shown in some of the previous uh, information given to us. Um, it seems like Keeble, there was nothing left of uh, pretty much his. Uh, it seems like the designer altered the bays that are on the right side. Uh, and, and we were told that the left side was something that was done by Keeble and it was actually by Ben Glasgow. And, uh, and, I, and it sure looks like the columns in the front do not match the columns that are stand there today. So there's a lot of things missing that uh, I find a hard. I don't debate that Fujin wasn't a historic figure, uh, but I think if he were alive today, he might not uh, associate himself with what's there today. Ron? Well, first, uh, thank both sides for a thorough analysis. Um, yes, absolutely, I, I'm sorry. Uh, to, to everybody involved, um, Russell and Rocky, uh, Wendell, um, Kim, um, we really appreciate, appreciate the time and effort that you put into this. Um, while the presentation has been going on, I've been doing a little surfing on the internet, um, looking at homes that are on Davidson County's list of historic places. I'm not an expert. I've been around uh, and worked on homes that are on them. One I did with Wendell uh, um, and he mentioned in his presentation. Uh, and I've been around uh, submissions being made to put a home or properties on the list of historic places. It's, it is a brutally long process and it is thorough and exhaustive in its evaluation to determine whether it meets the criteria to get onto that list. It's an exclusive list. Um, I don't make those decisions. I'm not on the board that makes them, but I've been around it. I don't see that this house, it could be considered eligible. I don't want to disagree with, with Mr. Walker. Um, I don't know that Mr. Walker has been to the property. I have, I've been to it, uh, countless times throughout the process that Wendell was working on it. I was asked periodically to step in and offer opinions on certain improvements. Um, I can say that Wendell's evaluation uh, probably uh, has very, uh, well, I think it's thorough and accurate. I, I couldn't find any uh, points that I would want to dispute at a high level. I think he was honest and sincere. I think everybody is honest and sincere, but if I go through the list of possesses one or more of the following criteria, and maybe that's what board members we probably should do, I'm all ears, but uh, I think if I was to advise the board, I think we take the list that uh, we have and start checking yes or no on a box. Um, other board members chime in. Uh, let's hear from Bunny and Jeanette. Um, and then we'll go back and do, do the checklist. Um, I think that what Wendell went through was very informative. Um, there, are, I mean, I can probably be persuaded either way. And it's, it is, I, th I do think it's a historic home that has had some poorly done work. Uh, but I, I, could see the main part of the house restored. Um, I think driving down Chickering Road and driving up the driveway, you know, I think it'll be a loss if it's torn down, to be honest. I, I understand that a lot of it has been stripped away though. And so we have to weigh that. The columns and the shutters don't bother me at all. I mean, those things have to be replaced on old homes. I'm not, upset that the originals aren't there. And if someone were to restore this, they, they have the plans, they could go back and do it accurately. You know, obviously it could be restored. It could be restored. So um, I understand that the shape that it, in, it is in right now, it wouldn't be eligible for the 
National Historical Register, which really isn't irrelevant. I mean, we're not trying to get houses on. That's not our goal as a committee. Our goal as a committee is to preserve the homes in Bellmead that have contributed to our history and have a place. And I think you can argue that this one does. It's had a lot of work done to it, which is the problem. But I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I can, as I said, right now, I can be persuaded either way. Um, all right. I'm curious what Jeanette you, thinks. She hasn't, you, the I'm, last time she was not on the call. No, but I did read all of the um, discussion and read the minutes. So I do feel like um, I was there on the first one, but not the second one. And I do see um, that there has been a lot of work on by everyone to give us the information that we need to consider this. And I do think we now fully have that information and I want to say that I appreciate the work that has gone into that. Um, I do think that this is a property that contributed, contributes um, to the his, you know, historical and architectural context of Bell Mead. But I do think it would be helpful to go through these elements as this is going to be to date, our hardest decision yet. And I do want to set a precedent that this is not something that we will do lightly, um, allow the demolition of a house of this significance from this art, from an architect of this significance. And because I do renovate myself and I am, uh, working with the Metro Historic Commission quite a bit on historic houses, I do see a difference between things that are maintenance issues, such as uh, shutters and columns and uh, windows, rather than the actual structure itself. And the structure itself of the original 1939 home, I do believe is still standing and still characteristic of this architect and this time period. So I personally feel that we need to go through each element and discuss each element to see how we're going to weigh the balance of whether enough has been taken away as to you know, balance take that out of balance and say that this is, we are going to allow to demolish it. And I do appreciate, um, you know, the, the Pfeffer to Road uh, new house that they've submitted, I do think is a lovely home, but these are bifurcated decisions because nothing would keep this owner from having, getting the demolition permit and then selling the property or coming to us with something else. So while I do appreciate that, that is not, I'm not going to take that into consideration for this portion of the decision um, for whether to demolish the house. Well, and my opinion on where it stands is, is like Kim's. Um, was Pugin uh, a, a good, renowned, famous architect? I think yes. Is the house historically significant? Yes. Can it be fixed? Uh, I think largely it can be fixed. You can put the bay windows back exactly like they were, and you can put the columns back on, and you can put shutters back on, and you can put the flooring back in. So it is fixable. Um, but I think uh, Ron and Jeanette are exactly right. We need to go through each of the items on the list and make a determination. Um, Mal, can uh, I just respond to what you just said for a second? Sure. Our, our commission does not ask people to fix and bring things back to their original state. That That is historic preservation. That is a that's something that is done at the Metro Historic level, but our commission does not do that. So we have to look at what's been done and we cannot ask the owners to, 
to fix or put it back the way that it was. So we have to decide as it is, may it go for, is it still significant enough that it, it is a property of significance? I just wanna clarify that that's, and, and I think Wendell, you said a couple of times saying that they would be handcuffed to preserving, you know, the um, shutters that are there and the shutter dogs that are not, we're not, that is not what we are asking people to do is to specifically preserve everything that is on the house as it is. That's not our role. Your, your point's well taken. Um, uh... I guess I, my, my working assumption was that if you're gonna, if they can't tear it down, they're gonna have to remodel it. And if you're gonna remodel it, why wouldn't you do it correctly? But that's a, that's a separate issue. I agree that, with that, Mal, that could be done. That's your point. Yes. Mr. Chairman, at some point before you start your analysis, I wanted to see if I could give, just give the commission some general guidance on the, on the guidelines. Just let me know when you think that would be helpful. Go right, now it's fine. Now it's fine. I just wanted to remind you of, of some of the provisions in our guidelines. And uh, the general one is the one you've all been talking around and talking about right now is, you know, uh, demolition of a, of a property of significance is typically not to be approved by the Historic Zoning Commission, but there's an exception where the building has lost its architectural and historical value. So that's sort of a general consideration for this whole discussion. And then as you know, on page four and five of your guidelines, you've got a two-part analysis. One is whether or not the property meets the criteria of a property of significance. Of course, the threshold requirement is that it be constructed before 1939, but then you've got a number of uh, requirements, um, and this is where you're going to go through the checklist. Does it possess all of these requirements? And, and that gets it past a certain a certain hurdle and then secondly it must possess one or more of the following criteria and you have a list of uh, criteria A through G at pages four and five of your guidelines that talk about you know is it identification with an historical person does it that possess distinguishing of characteristics and architectural type and those sorts of things so uh, like I said, general considerations, if you're not going to allow a tear down of a significant property, you might if it's lost its historical significance or architectural significance, and then you have to go through secondarily this, this uh, two-part analysis of does it even meet the criteria of a, of a property of significance, and second, in addition to that, does it possess the, one of these specific criteria? Do you all, does everyone have their guidelines in front of them, or? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I don't have good. mine in front of me. Could you, is it? Pages four and five. Pages four and five. The general considerations I read to you are on page 17. Pages yeah. four and five of the analysis you want to go through. Just want to make sure everybody was reading off the same page, proverbial. So thanks, guys. I'm sitting here to listen now. So starting at the beginning, um, generally, these will be properties built prior to 1939. So I'm assuming we can all agree it was built before 1939? Yes, I, I know there was an argument to be made that the um, additions that were built later made the square footage, um, the average of the square footage later than that, but, but I don't think that's how we're, um, how this commission looks at it. The original structure was, 19 prior to 1939. So I think I would say yes to that criteria. Well, the next one on the list is the one that's probably going to be the most contentious. Possesses integrity of design, materials, workmanship, setting, location, feeling, and association as defined for being eligible for the National Register. So um, it's from Warren's report, or Wendell, I'm sorry, Wendell's report, um, there's not much left of the original finishes and detailing in the place. Well, the integrity of design is, is the major factor for me. And we have a, 
um, statement from the Historical Commission stating that it is would be eligible for listing. It's not whether it has been or whether it is likely to be, but whether it is eligible. Yeah. And I think, but, uh, pulling, my, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, Jeanette. my position is that it is eligible. And I would say uh, on the approach of the home, yes, it has the, the wings on the sides may different, but it still feels to me like the main house that was there originally when you approach it, um, you know, it's the facade is not drastically changed. Well, I, I think that a lot of the, uh, you know, the cornice has changed, um, just just the doors have changed. And then, then are we saying that only the main body of the house is what we're looking at or? Well, I think we're uh, looking at it as a whole, but as far as the main body, I think that though, uh, this, I'm, I'm, they haven't changed the style of the house. There haven't been, there, there may be elements that have, changed but not i don't think have significantly changed this for, for, for the main house. body of the house uh -huh. but the two wings have been added on after that 39 yes time frame so i guess what do we look at there i think we look at it as a whole and i mean it, it's so typical that in any of these homes that we reviewed they're gonna i mean most of the houses in Bellmead have had additions at some point but if you ask what year was this house built, I think you'd put down at 1939, the house was built. Yeah, I, I feel like I would need to know a lot more about the National Register of Historic Places in order to answer that question. Well, except that we had the Metro, was it the Tennessee or Metro Historical Director? Who spoke about that? Jeanette, you Mr. just- Mr. Walker. Uh-huh, is he for the state or Metro? I'm not sure. I was looking for the letter letter that Kim read to us. Is that something that's in our? I think that was. I think that was an email he said he got like 20 minutes before the meeting. Okay. Yeah, and I think it was Metro. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think we can't be an expert in every area, guys. I mean, we're doing our. We, you know, we. I think that's an opinion that we weigh in this. But well, I agree with Jeanette what she said earlier on that. I, I agree with. Um, I guess Wendell a little bit more about the integrity of the work. I mean, it has been changed significantly from what was there originally. Okay. I uh, think it, I think it passes this particular um, level, and when we get into later, as Doug said, when we get later into whether some of those changes have altered it. That that is when I would. That's when I would evaluate those things that Wendell brought to light. But I think for this initial review, because we have been told that it is eligible, and I think that it does possess the integrity of design. In my opinion, I do think it passes this second criteria. And I, I tend to agree with you. Item number three does the house embody other qualities and characteristics as in the judgment of the zoning commission should be considered significant to the historical and architectural context of Bell Mead. Um, and I think it probably does. It's one of the first houses built here, one of the biggest houses built here. Um, it's always been part of Bell Mead. I don't disagree with that, um, Mal. But back up just a second for me. I'm wondering how much weight we are going to give to the statement of it being eligible by Walker. I'm, I'm, we've learned, uh, if we've learned anything in, in the last couple of months, is that what, what things get said quickly, and when we start to then revisit them, we get a clearer understanding. Um, so, just want to say that regarding the weight of eligibility for this house. Well, on, on that, that, that piece of it, Ron, I've got two concerns. One is the fact that there are no footings, <laughs> though it's been sitting there for 90 years and hadn't apparently moved very much. 
and the other is that the addition that was put on, uh, I think in 98, maybe it was 94 on the left hand side is not very good. Um, all the other things that we've talked about, finishes, detailing, uh, uh, trim, uh, doors, windows, the whole nine yards, those things can all be uh, repaired. And after 90 years, um, they should be. Well, do we want to continue going through so we can so we can get through sure, the list? Sure. I mean, we're not making a decision on each one. No. Okay. Um, for uh, if the is the house listed or determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, and or be determined to be a contributing property to an eligible historic district in the National Register of Historic Places. So That's what I'm saying. I don't, they don't think we can answer that question. I don't think Tim Walker answers that question. Board members? I, I tend to agree I with think you. Unless somebody went through the, yeah, I, I, I don't think we can answer it either, but unless, I think unless a homeowner starts going through the process, none of us can answer it. Right. Agree about and, it. And I don't know. I mean, that, that can be a confusing to, you know, to this analysis. Well, it, here's, here's my, here's the question. And it's, I guess it's for Doug. You've said that we have to consider, Doug, all five, all four of these paragraphs collectively. Um, so there's no point in us even talking about these houses if the owner isn't willing or in the process of putting it on the National Historic Register. Well, I don't think it quite says that, Mr. Chairman. So it, let, let's go through it clause by clause. Although it's, it, it's certainly not listed, as I understand it or determined eligible for listing in the National Register. I, I think, although it's, I don't want to comment on the evidence, it's not my job to do so. I think Mr. Walker's opinion probably was that it was eligible for listing. And, but then you've got another clause and or be determined to be a contributing property to an eligible historic district, which they'll need is not yet, I guess, are we, we're not a eligible historic district in the National Register of Historic Places. I don't think we've gotten that criteria and that, that standard met yet. So I guess you would have to determine whether or not you feel like Mr. Walker's opinion was sufficient to, to find that it, that, that it was eligible for listing. It clearly is not listed, listed and the homeowner can't be compelled to try to get it listed first, that would be contrary to their interest among other things. So I think you can make a finding about whether the evidence you heard today meets that standard. I, I don't think it's fair to to delay ruling on the petition on the application because you don't, I mean, well, I, I, th I think you've heard something that tries to be evidence of, of eligibility for this and this is that. bad. So you'll have to decide whether that's sufficient evidence. That's the way I've that's the way I heard it. That's the way I would look at it. So I, I, would, I, would, go, I would go on with your analysis and see what else you come up yeah, with. Yeah, I would agree. And I would agree that it's not only Mr. Walker's um, opinion that was read to us, but it was it's the breadth of um, all of the facts that we have been given. Right. Um, Thank you for that reminder, Janet. And I didn't mean yeah. short, to, to give short shrift. There's been a lot of evidence, documentary evidence. Yes by these experts, which you are all, you're supposed to consider all of it. So I, right. I, I agree with what you just said. Thank you for reminding yeah. me. So let's go on. Looking, one other comment that I'm, I was just thinking about as you were saying that is, you know, yes, yeah, some of these features have been stripped out, but you, let's say that somebody bought this and wanted to get on the National Register of Historic Places, could they do the work to make that possible? I believe they could, which is Mal's point earlier. 
if they wanted to do the work to, I mean, there are things I worked for the Hermitage for years. I mean, we, we replaced things there. We were, they were done accurately, but we did replace them. They weren't the original products. And so if someone had this home and decided, Hey, I want to get this home listed, then could they, could they do it? And I think they probably could do it if they put the work into it. So I guess that that's more, is it in the realm of possibility? Is that, is bear, Doug, are we allowed to look at it like that? Is that, I mean, it's just such a. My question would be is there's been so many additions to this thing. How do you get something on a national register of historic places with that many additions on it? But when you look at the footprint, we're not, of, we're not making a determination yeah. of whether it can be on it. It's whether it's eligible. And yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, low threshold to determine whether something is eligible based on all the historical data that we have been given. I th I, once again, I just repeat, just all the evidence you've heard apply it as best you can to the standards in these guidelines. And I think you've heard, as I said, an, uh, uh, an opinion by someone who is, is Tim Walker is an expert probably in this area. And if anyone in Nashville is, he has offered an opinion that it's eligible as I heard it. And then you've got all the other evidence you've heard and you just have to determine whether you think that's enough. I don't, I don't agree or disagree with the contention. But I would go on Mr. Chairman and see what else you got. Um, another another conjunction and and then you go down possesses one or more of the following criteria. So. Yes, and it uh, is it a noble a notable work of a master builder, designer, architect. Um, probably it is. Where, where, which one is that, man? No, I think uh, we're, we're at A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, so, we're, right. so we're saying possesses A, a broad cultural, political, economic, or social association with a historical development of Bellamy, the state, or the nation. And, and I think the answer to that is yes from um, all of the um, evidence that we have heard. Okay, Ident identification with the historic person or important events in Bellmead. Not I don't. Really. I don't know that we've heard anything about that. I don't think so. Okay. Possesses distinguishing characteristics of an architectural type, reflect reflective of the dominant styles in Bellmead, and is inherently va valuable for the study of a period style method of construction or use of indigenous materials and craftsmanship? Probably not. I think it did at one time. I don't think it does now. Right. Right. Okay. So D possesses authenticity of its period of significance as evidenced by the survival of its characteristics historic fabric and architectural elements from that period. I think that's where it fails. Yeah, it got stripped away. But that's right. a, the, the category, the head on this says one or more. So it doesn't have to right. get every one of those, right? Right, that's correct. These are, these are just things that we are evaluating, but we're just having a discussion on each point as whether or not we think they exist or do not exist. Okay, okay. great. Mm -hmm. So now we're to E, is a notable work of a master builder, designer, or architect. And, and I would say yes to that. I would do. Um, then we're on to F, possesses or may likely yield information important in prehistory or history or history. I don't think that I don't think does. So. I don't think we've heard anything to that effect. Possesses other qualities and characteristics that in the judgment of the HCZ should be considered for designation as a significant property. I didn't see a standard I don't quality. See that. No. So 
So do we want to each of us say where we're leaning on this? Are we, because we're going to vote today. Yeah. Yep. And I'll, I'll just say that I find this difficult because I do think that there is existing part of, you know, the structure that it was at one point a significant um, building in Belmede. But my feeling is that it is outweighed by the additions, the stripping of the integrity of the materials and basically the lack of care. But I also wanna point out that in no case would I ever feel this way if the applicant had owned the property during that period of time. So one thing that um, Wendell did point out is that th this is not something that this um, owner has let happen because I don't wanna create a situation where any homeowner feels that they can let something fall into disrepair or to um, let something go so that it, that it can pass this. So I am leaning towards uh, voting a, a yes on demolition for this property. Um, you wanna go ahead and put that in the form of a motion and we can well, I don't know. Or does behind. everybody want to discuss yes. how they feel? I just went first. Uh, be, a better, a better procedure, in my opinion, would be to make it a motion in a second and then have further discussion if you want it. But, Mr. Woodson, if you do so, I would state in, re, repeat in your motion, if you don't mind, the, the things you've just said in the discussion and, and then get a second. And if a second is it out there, and then, of course, the chair can allow further discussion. Well, I will do that then. I will make a motion that we approve the request for this, the demolition of this particular property. Um, I would like to add a caveat that this is a difficult decision for the board to make. And one of the decisions, um, one of the main criteria for my decision is that this was a process of over 30 years of alterations to this home that ultimately led to its demise, that it was a contributing house in Belmede, and that part of my decision is that the current homeowners did not contribute to that 30-year demise of this property. I'd like to second that motion. Okay. Um, Jeanette? Javen. Your vote, Jeanette. Uh, will we, no one else to have a discussion about it. Oh, you want to discuss it? Okay. I would just say that the, I, it's. I agree with Jeanette that it's such a hard decision on this one um, because we our com, this commission was established just to protect these older homes, and this is hard because it is an older. Um, that I think is significant and there's so many things about it that Wendell has like the house has just been stripped. You're losing me? Yes. Yeah, you, you faded out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just, um, I don't know how much of you heard, so I'll repeat it, but my concern, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about approving the demolition of this house because there are expert opinions that are asking us not to do it. But on the other hand, I listened to Wendell and Wendell has is very familiar with the house and it sounds like a lot of, that the house in, in many ways has been completely corrupted. And so, I, you know, I'm struggling with it. I've you know, I do believe that it could be, I renovate, uh, you know, I like to renovate houses too. And I do believe that the things that have, have been torn up about it could be put back. Um, the additions on the side are, you know, I would say unattractive and not in particularly 
well planned and and I don't think they look very good on the house. But is the main body of the house worth is the house worth preserving? I mean, that's just where I'm I'm coming down to, and it's just such I I don't know. I want to hear from the other guys too. Well, I think buddy, I agree with you. you've hit on something, and Jeanette hit it on it as well. That and Mal is is things could be put back, but we don't we don't possess in our ordinance the requirement to make an applicant do that. Well, we wouldn't be making him do it. We would just say, could it be done? If he sold the property or if somebody wanted to do it, no, he could meet a lot more that's of an, that's an over, very overarching, we're, I'm struggling as well, but I think that's an overarching analysis to say, okay, that could it be put back? I mean, it's not any, now. House, any house brought before us in 39 that we say that they can demolish, somebody could say, oh, all those things could be put back. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I've evaluated it. I'm, I've, I've, my, my roommate in college did drawings for applicants to be placed on the historic register. And one of their things that they did was they performed very thorough analysis and they would go out and determine just the things that we've been presented as whether, how, how authentic are those things? Yeah. Um, and for that reason, um, I, I don't wait my, uh, Wendell gave a great presentation, but I don't wait my decision as much on what Wendell said as, as I wait my decision on. I've been to the house. Mm -hmm. um, everything that he said and saw and presented, I've seen firsthand. It doesn't have the original moldings. All right. Um, it, 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 lacks, it lacks the things that I would be looking for to say we must save those. Do I struggle with tearing down this house on Chickering? Absolutely, I do. But when I look at the list that we've put in writing, there are more things that it doesn't include, in my opinion, in terms of it being um, a property of significance, than there are the other way. So, I mean, so, so I've done a little, I've done a checkbox mark on all of those things, and it it does not check those. Another concerning thing for me is that foundation issue. If we did save it, you know, and add on to it, you know, what, what, how does that construction wise, how does that longevity occur? So we have a, a second to the motion, I believe. Anybody else want to speak? And I'm assuming the finding inherent in the motion is that, am I muted? No, is that you're, you're, you're finding that this property is not a property of significance that under the criteria in the state, in the guidelines, is that correct? That's yes, that's, that's correct. Assuming that's part of your motion. So yes, Jeanette, that is I understand Jeanette's motion to say that she is making a motion that this is not a property of significance based on the criteria that is that is within our ordinance. Correct. That, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. And so that Jeanette, is how I'm evaluating it. Jeanette, your your vote. Are we voting now? Yes. I am voting yes uh, to allow the demolition of this property. Um, Gavin? Uh, yes. Bunny? Yes. And Mal votes no. Ron? Ron. Doesn't that give us a majority? Do I have to vote? Uh, hey, guys, <laughs> um, I vote yes. <laughs> Okay. All right. New business. Guys, can we take just a two minute break? We've been at this. I need to. Two hours. Uh, yeah. Can we, can we have a 60 second break, Ethan? Uh, sure. I, turn your video off. <laughs> are we not going to talk about the uh, new home? Is that, is that not up for discussion? Or are we going to wait till another month? 
Well, I saw in the submission that that is not what is being not being presented. That was what was presented last month and we deferred them under that understanding. So okay. my position is it was not on the board. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't review that for today. Now, you know, could I make a comment at this point? Sure. I just want to commend the to each member of the, the historic zoning and to the presenters that this has been a, a, I know, very difficult decision and y'all handle it with so much professionalism. I just want to thank everybody for the time they spent with this. And whether you're on the, whether you're a winner or a loser on this, uh, it was very well done, very professionally handled. Thank you. And hey, members, this is Rocky King. We will, we will bring back the drawings and get on the next available commission hearing to discuss the, the new drawings. Um, you all have devoted a tremendous amount of time to this, so we will not take up uh, more of your time. Thank you. Thanks, Rocky. All right, uh, I guess we're gonna take a two minute intermission. Two minute break. Now you want a beer? Oh, you can't drink it, City Hall. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> well, what if I open my window and step outside? <laughs> I think I will go get a beer. <laughs> <sighs> Who is that? That, moan, that big moan. That was Bunny. Okay, Bunny. A long time for me to sit still. Look, I got a beer. Wasn't kidding. I can't see it. There it is. It's a Corona Extra. I can't. Hell, look, it disappears. With, I think I'll change my background to something that's more appropriate. There we go, that's nighttime. Let's move downtown. Mm. I guess I could move to, move to Lower Broad and not be right in place with the beer. Let's see, how about that? Oh, that's not bad. That's Lower Broad. Printer's Alley. Ron, I moved to Printer's Alley. Wish I could join you. Well, <laughs> got, a, got a beer. That was it. It disappears when it goes in front of the green screen. Look at that. Alice Chapman has this wonderful smile been on her face since we started this meeting. It hasn't changed. Not a bit. <clears throat> Jeanette, are the airplanes still flying over your head and all times of the day? And not really. Uh, I mean, just in just in bad weather. Oh. <laughs> that I, I think I'm on their alternate. That right? So you've got them. You got them flying higher now, huh? I did. I took care of that. Good for you. Good 
that Jeanette making all that noise? Not me. No, Jeanette. That was Jeanette talking, though. Not Bunny and Jeanette sound a little bit alike. I don't know how to comment about that. <laughs> uh, we're waiting on. Are we all back? I'm back. Ron is back. I'm here. All right. Your legal counsel is got either not either got his back turned or he's not there. All right. We can start without him. There he is. There he is. <laughs> Lyle. All right. Here we go. First item under new business: the application for a certificate for DAC Properties, LLC, 717 Westview West Avenue to construct a new single-family home on a vacant lot. Alex? Hey, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Alex, you got some a feedback on your end. If you would, I don't know if you're on a phone or computer, but turn one or the other off. What about now? That's good. Is that better? Okay. Yes. All right, I might turn the... Uh, the camera off too. It's it. Uh, I've been having bad connection lately, so in case it keeps glitching out. But um, um, welcome. You know, <laughs> that was a long deliberation you guys had for a couple hours, but good decision at the end. So this is my first time um, presenting to Historic. So thank you for your time, and uh, you know we'll definitely answer a lot of your questions because I won't know exactly what to. You know, show you. Maybe we start Lyle with the uh, inspiration images. No, the the package right below that. Yes. I'd like to mention also that this went through the Board of Zoning Appeals and passed uh, last month. Thank you, Lyle. So we had um, we have a little bit of a obviously a different situation than the house you guys just deliberated on. The property at 717 Westview has already been demolished, the, the old house before. It was demolished prior to our um, current owners uh, obtaining the property. Uh, we were tasked with the project maybe back in the summertime, and we've been developing these concepts for a long time now uh, as we move to acquire permits for construction. But the inspiration for this house is is not necessarily to copy or to be um, directly resembling any specific house in Belmine, uh, but it's really to kind of um, to pay homage to the character of each individual house. And, and if we were to wrap up the top houses in Belmine, we, we're given kind of a unique opportunity here because it's one of the most, uh, one of the largest lots and it's empty and vacant, allowing us, for us to have a lot of you know opportunity and create something very beautiful on this site. So the inspiration images we're showing here are kind of the initial atmosphere we wish to establish. And uh, we are kind of tasked with the um, direction of doing a Mediterranean villa, but with the modern floor plan that is a little bit more a formal or informal than what you would find in a you know a very symmetrical French villa. So it kind of tends itself to more of a countryside feeling and atmosphere more than the typical French villas that you would think of. So these are images just to capture some of the atmosphere that we're hoping to create and bring to the site itself. A lot of the details we're even looking at, um, we just received a package to uh, for the seals and the door copings and um, the casements around the windows. Uh, we're working with a manufacturer in France that makes that has a wide array of antique limestone to bring some of this kind of rustic antique feelings that you're seeing in a lot of these images into the house itself. So we're trying to kind of have the house feel like it's been there for a long time and has a presence that's uh, a little bit more antique than it is just purely modern and new. And you see with a lot of these images, some of the classical details and features that we are looking at trying to express on the facades and uh, throughout the project.
Uh, we also were trying to incorporate a lot of ivy um, within the back area around the pool area. The house is right now, um, we'll look at the square footages here in a second, but it's a six bedroom house and we have a pool in the back uh, and a pool house in the back. And as what Lyle described, we just received approval for the pool and the fencing and the grading plan in the back. But these images are again, showing some of the inspiration. Do you wanna go, I think that's the final slide, right, Craig? Yeah, let's go to uh, the main drawing package. I think that was the landscape package. Yes, that one. So uh, if you go, yeah, we can, we can start there. So these are the elevations, the current elevations for the house. Maybe scroll uh, down one more slide. That's the front elevation is the top one. We have some renderings to accompany these that have a little bit more of a realistic uh, feeling and nature to it. But what you're seeing in this image is the right side is the main two story volume. And we're hoping to have a very thick, strong French limestone uh, cap on the building. Uh, it'll probably end up being a little bit thicker and more articulated than what we're showing in the drawing currently. Um, the, the window to the right is a large window that sees a, um, a beautiful plaster spiral staircase right behind it, rising up to the second floor. And then we'll have a large front um, solid wood door that we're hoping to get some of the wood kind of refurbished and to make it feel like it's antique with a nice limestone um, coping all the way around the door frame. So a lot of these very French, we have these two large um, steel door units with uh, that are arched that are set back into a little bit courtyard in the front facade. On the back side is one of the most prominent features uh, around the pool area. That unit is about 14 foot tall and it really creates a presence and atmosphere. And we're hoping to chamfer the, the threshold and the surround of that uh, unit. So it feels a little bit more uh, sculpted into the wall. The overall building height right now is 29 foot from the, the largest building is 29 feet from the finished floor. Um, and the finished floor is a couple feet from the, it's actually almost flush with the current topography, but we're gonna drop the topography about a foot, foot and a half right there at the entry. So we're looking at no more than 30, 30 and a half feet tall from the topography. Um, you can scroll up and show the other elevations as well. The side elevations. It's uh, a little bit more um, difficult to understand the building in terms of these elevations, just because there's a lot of informality and a lot of movement within the um, architecture. So we can also show the site plan and the floor plan, if that's okay. So here's the site plan and it shows the old house and how we're kind of respecting the kind of proximity to the road of the old, the old house that was there before and the new layout with the pool and the pool house uh, towards the rear. The pool house is there within the building envelope just to create a little bit more privacy towards the, the rear lot that you see there. Garage is kind of close up against the property line. So we wanted to make sure to have a little bit more privacy and create a courtyard feeling in the back. The image, yes, the next is the floor plan. And I don't know, you know how we can answer questions uh, or we can sit on this image if that's something that's actually important for this particular meeting. Alex, do you have the materials list, Chief? Yeah, we have that on the application. Uh, and maybe let's, let's go through the renderings uh, as well really quickly. And then we can go through the application to give the material list. And then that will, you know. So here was kind of our initial rendition. Obviously we can't really um, you know, our, our capabilities uh, for this rendering wasn't there enough to give you an exact feeling because I think once we add all the rustic uh, nature of the limestones and the doors and the surrounds, we're going to have a much more rustic and, and authentically French uh, villa than 
what we're portraying. That's why the inspiration photos were so important for us to, to show you guys. But this will at least show the overall, you know, um, scale and the buildings, how it's supposed to step and move. This is the back area with three arches that um, frame a covered area, a pool in front of it and a pool house um, out of hopefully local stone. Uh, we fell in love with some of the local stone walls that are on the site and hope to kind of mimic, mimic that as well and bring that into some of these low walls that are around the property. And that's the view back to the main building with the, the archway and the arches on the left. So again, these are just ideas of scale, but you know, once we have the ivy um, growing up the walls and we bring in some of these authentic French, you know, capping material and uh, surrounds on door frames that we are working with, you know, a French artisan to kind of create, it'll be a much more custom feeling to these, to this uh, experience. Could okay, this, and then yeah, go on. This sorry. And can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Can you just give a summary of the overall um, design and design period of the house and how you feel that it fits into the neighborhood that you're going to be building? Yes, we, um, you know, we have another um, file also that we can bring up and we, we kind of located about six properties that are uh, six or eight, I think actually was that were surrounding, um, you know, in Belmead. Uh, mm -hmm. And not all of them speak directly to what we're trying to do. But um, w I would say the closest thing that I can under uh, that I can explain to you guys, it's, it's kind of a, a revival Mediterranean villa. But because we're bringing in some of the authentic limestone um, from France, so we'll have some of the French countryside kind of feeling associated with what that means. Um, that is probably the best I can do to explain it. There's a time period, you know, associated with that that's ongoing even now, but, you know, we, we don't see a lot of this particular style in Belmede and we think, and that was the reason we, we chose it when wanted to express it because we think it would be a great addition for Belmede, especially on a lot that allows us the ability to do something a little bit more freely and the scale of the property doing something a little bit, you know, more dramatic. This, this house is one of my favorite in Belmede, actually. And just because of the detailing, we're getting a little bit closer to understanding how there's uh, a simplicity um, approach to the materiality, but there's a strong cap or coping around these windows and doors and the frames of the limestone, or in this case, uh, some plaster, some limestone, but it's, it gives a better kind of understanding and feeling. Now the roof line for that particular house is very different than the roof style we're thinking. And this evokes a much more um, Spanish villa, whereas we're thinking a little bit more French kind of villa and classical with a, a strong coping um, of limestone around that kind of parapet wall. This is one not too far from where, you know, the Westview property is that we're discussing now. And this one's not, you know, maybe not there, but again, the materiality is something we were looking at, just the overall tones and the stucco and the windows and the coping, but it's, it's you know, it's hard to identify how this relates directly. Be careful what you say about that house. It's a beautiful house. Thank beautiful you. House. It's mine. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's, yeah. It definitely uh, stood out to us when we were kind of, you know, going through Belmede and, and picking and choosing, you know, elements to kind of reference and, and what we thought was beautiful and what we thought relate very similarly to what we were, you know, trying to achieve. But I do think this house, you know, in of itself is hopefully going to be another step forward, you know, within the architectural style that is kind of established. And there's, there, and I will say one other thing, some of these houses like this one we're looking at, there's an informality within the massing, but there's also a formality within the, the layout of the windows or the layout of each individual volume. I think our approach so far has been 
a little bit more where we were utilizing the limestone and a lot of these kind of strong materiality features in the ivy to create that kind of formal and strength. Uh, and we're kind of utilizing the architecture to create a little bit more of a domestic um, informality to the way we're thinking about how, you know, the windows or the movement of the space around. So I don't know if that makes sense uh, per se. It doesn't really fall under a, a necessarily it doesn't, you can't point to one particular historical moment in time and say they did that as well. But I think that overall the feeling and the atmosphere we're trying to create, you know, there's moments and glimpses of that within all of the projects, the inspiration package and some of the existing houses that we're showing. One thing that we asked is that you have an identifiable architectural style. <clears throat> My question, particularly with the roof line on this house, all the flat roof, I just don't know that it looks to me like a French Mediterranean style house. You th don't think it does or you think it I, does? Not the roof, the flat, the entire house with a flat roof, I question. And the uh, okay, materials well, list too, if we could see that. Sorry, say that one more time. I don't know and why. And I would I also like to see the materials list. Yeah, okay, so here's the material list. We're looking at doing mainly steel windows and a little bit of uh, aluminum clad windows when we have non-operable. Uh, we are looking at a frame material. And like I said, we have, uh, we just got in a whole crate of this beautiful limestone from France um, that we're hoping to utilize over the window sills, the frames, the doors um, as much as possible uh, and, and the cap too on the, on the building. Um, the brick paint and natural, we're hoping to do a real stucco that has more of a beigey kind of, you know, almost a little bit hint of red or yellow. We haven't quite decided yet that would give it a more of a rustic kind of natural feeling probably a fine finished stucco as well just with how the texture will receive against the limestone and the windows too going back to the windows windows hopefully will be that kind of beigey tone so all together you'll have those three tones of the beige window the light beige french limestone that you have instead of the gray and then also the beige stucco and that we're hoping those three materialities within a monotone will create a strong character. We have shutters as well that will fall within that same monotone category. Um, railings, columns, pilasters, all steel and aluminum. I mean, you guys, do I need to read these out for you or is it? Oh, no. Just, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. I think the pictures that you've presented are mainly Spanish revival homes. Um, and to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically creating a modern house but using rustic and historic materials that have been found in Spanish revival homes and um, you know French Mediterranean homes, but it to me probably is more um, in keeping with some of the modern homes that we have in Belmede. Um, Bunny, if you're trying to you know find a discernible style. To me, it is a modern house. And my question was um, the roof pitch, Lyle, was that, was this completely flat roof approved at the Board of Zoning Appeals? Was that a variant? It, it was approved. There's caveat within the ordinance for uh, this style home, yes. Okay. So I, you know, I, I think there are some houses, they're not listed here um that would be probably more relevant i understand why you included the picture of the house you did basically for tone and texture and feeling but it, it probably would be maybe our first example of a modern home that's being built all from 800 surface janet i think can, can, you, can you hear me okay yeah I think that's a very fair analysis, actually. And when we were filling out the application originally, we did put a modern Mediterranean villa as our classification, because I think you're, you're exactly right. We're looking at something that has a more of a modern understanding of architectural massing and uh, right. architectural space and window arrangement. But within that, we're trying to we soften the architectural features completely through this very, you know, if I were to say anything, it would almost be 
that it was a French country villa renovated into mo something more modern w while maintaining the character of what was there. That's how I see it. And, and you're right, French country villas, a lot of them do have, you know, pitch roofs, various uh, slope sizes. And some of them do have this strong capping that you see represented a lot actually in Charleston or, you know, other places like that where they're trying to kind of mimic that style. And, but what we have shown within the inspiration package of um, existing houses in Belmead, we, we, it's, it's hard to, I, you might know more than I do about the existing homes in Belmead. And I think we were kind of showing a little bit um, more Spanish style and mainly for those features around, like you're saying, the materiality and right. less so for the style itself. So that's a very fair you know, argument. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pinpoint, you know, one particular style when you're trying right. to do something, you know, a little bit more stronger and iconic without copying, you know, the other styles that are already on Westview or already on Delmi Boulevard that are, you know, not too far away. They're beautiful homes, gorgeous homes. Ron, do you have any comments? Ron, you're on mute, no. I think. Um, I do. First, uh, appreciate the presentation and the description. I agree somewhat with Jeanette's analysis of a modern home uh, interpretation of a varying styles, be it Spanish, French. Um, maybe talk to the board about, um, I'm not opposed to flat roofs, but what was the driving force to include no pitch roof? You gave, I think you had some examples in there that, that showed both are lower pitches. And then um, my overarching comment of the, of the project is, is that first I appreciate um, the concept. What, um, I guess what I'm gonna say is not a critique of it, but what is going to make this project to me successful is the insurance of the inclusion of the details that you have continually described as we're hoping to use real stucco, we're hoping to use um, French limestone, um, and the drawings. I, I would, I would be asking that we need a very clear um, inclusion of what those are and where they're going to happen because I think that's going to make it successful. Um, everything that you've shown as it's being developed, I think would, could make it successful. Uh, but it, uh, to pull it off, it's gotta, it has to include those details. It's not, it's sort of stepping over the, the boundary of common details that can make houses look really well into a category of very uncommon details that have to be Im implemented to make it what you're describing. Um, if it was modern, some of the things that you, are trying to include would be stripped away from it, um, but it's not, at least in your description, its effort is to look like it, that it's been there. Um, I, I, go on, sorry for cutting you I, I, I'm being rambling, but I, like I said, I want to back up and first say, I appreciate the effort and I say that respectfully because I think it's a good one. I yeah, I, I, I agree with you 200%. I think that this house, especially if you stripped some of these details and materiality you're talking about away from it can easily convert into, you know, maybe something more modern and then it would reference more in line with like a color residence type of house. Uh, but I think that, you know, from my perspective and from the owner, you know, we are so, it's because of that, it is so important that those features be included to, inc because they are the architecture in some kind of way. It's a very different way of um, designing than even I'm used to a little bit. Like is what, this, what we were is this an owner occupied house or is this going to be a speculative house? It's a high end spec house. Okay. And yeah. so it, it's so important for us to create those soft features that we're discussing because the architecture is a little bit more um, stark, you know, and it, I think the capping and the door frame and the window frames and the shutters and these elements are so important for us to make sure that because I mean the way we're designing this and it's harder to see in these renderings, but the cap and the door frame and we have we've updated it slightly is the most important elements to create the strength of this 
facade. Now, you granted, you do have a lot of glass that you wouldn't find typically in an older kind of home, so it makes it modern in of itself. I mean, that big window alone kind of converts it into a different style, right? Um, but again, that's where we thinking it more like a renovation into it. And by me just saying we hope, it's it's almost like, you know, I'm just it's my language, just kind of subtly, you know, I we know that, we, you know, it's so important for us to achieve what you're talking about too for the success of the project. I think all that criticism we discuss on a daily basis on how important those features are. Uh, and to go back to your comment on the flat um, roof, I think that yeah. you know, from the very beginning, we've, we, it's been a discussion and we brought it up to the um, BZA and the board in the beginning to make sure, you know, even before we were went too far into design, to make sure that this would be allowed uh, within Belmede. And we've had this discussion maybe two, two or three occasions. And after we kind of got uh, verbal approval, we went ahead and submitted some elevations and received more approvals as we went. But the thought process really was to go back to those inspirational images we were showing and to make the style be more about the cap of the limestone materiality at the top and less about the roof line to create the strength and hold the brevity of the weight of the top of the building. And again, this image probably doesn't do it justice, you know, in terms of representing that. And, uh, you know, we, do, we have worked on in the last day or so a little bit more strength to, to show those kind of strengths of the cap, you know, molding and materiality that we find will, you know, hold its weight. Right now we're only showing on this image, for instance, about a six inch limestone cap with another six inch below trim. But I think it's gonna end up being about a foot and a half to two feet with uh, articulation around it. Uh, so there has been certain little upgrades from this that uh, would indicate that and, and justify the reasoning more in our eyes for you know making these kind of decisions. Um, this is Bunny again. When I'm looking at it, I feel like there's a contradiction of styles here. And the fact that we're all trying to figure out what the style is, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I think also, I know this street well. Uh, I don't see it, you know, we, we take into consideration what is around it. There are some lovely estate homes on this street. And I, I don't see this fitting in well, but my biggest concern is just, I think there are too many different things going on here without um, a particular style. If we're going rustic and then we have a huge window, we talk about, and, and really this doesn't feel to me at all like the inspiration photos that you showed us or the in, inspiration slide. Um, not the houses in Bell Me, but the actual inspiration style. All, or the, all of those houses had a sense of warmth that I don't see in this house at all. And I understand materials can help with that, but this is a very severe house to me. So those are my thoughts on it. Well, I, you know, that that is uh, sometimes the, the double-edged sword by showing renderings alone, you know, because renderings don't always well, the portray. Drawing, well, the, the, I mean, the, the the facts are the facts though. When you look at the windows and you look at the lines and you look at the severity of the flat roof, whether it's a rendering or not, it doesn't have the feel of your inspiration pictures. Well, the inspiration pictures, I think what he's saying, and I understand is that once the ivy wall and once the materials are on the wall, that soft, softens all the CAD hard edges. Everything looks bad in CAD. Well, it's just very steep. It's just the, everything is a sharp angle and severity. And the, the homes themselves that you showed the inspiration pictures did not have that level of severity, regardless of the ivy. I mean, the house with that, that you said when you wanted a lot of ivy on it, I know that house too well. It's a, it's a house in LA and um, it's, it it's not, doesn't have the severity of this house at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's hard for me to comment on, you know, comments like that, just because, you know, even if we look at the inspiration package and like it was mentioned, if we were to draw those in CAD or remove some of those little elements like the shutters or the um, lamp posts or some of the details uh, around, um, we could end up, you know, 
getting to a very stark rendition very quickly uh, on, on the architecture. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's about having, you're right, having some vision. I mean, I'm looking at the inspiration package now as, as I'm talking about this, and some of these walls are, you know, longer and flatter and more severe. It's maybe the roof line, like you're suggesting, has has helped to soften that or that's a, and that, that's one of the dom I would say the dominant feature of this home is a bunch of flat roofs. I mean, so you in your eyes, it's the yeah. I mean, that's exactly what you see. I mean, that that is, I, I would say that this is the dominant feature of this house is all flat roofs. Well, I would like to go back to Ron's comment about the uh, detailing and the uh, quality quantity of um, the trim elements in the house. Do we have enough information um, to make a decision on this thing? I, well, I will say that. that I was looking through the material list and it's pretty well fleshed out what it's going to be. I mean, there will but, not be no deviation from that will be allowed. But it's, but it's we're looking at the under drawings. That's where it's not. I'm talking about the elevations. Aren't yeah. you wrong, the elevation? Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I, I want to um, again say I, I'm, I'm respectful of the effort and of where they want to take this, but I'm not prepared to approve the project the sole fact that I want assurance of where those materials are going to be used. It, it, um, and so for, it, it's maybe it's a noting simply because, as I said, they've gone beyond typical detailing. And I say that respectfully and commendably. They've gone beyond typical detailing. So, but that's part of, that is not part of, I think that's what's going to make a house like this successful and will make it successful. His the inspiration images I would concur is that those are the ones that started when I just first opened it and look at the, the black and white drawings like we have up, my antenna went up a little bit. But when I dive into their inspiration and what they're doing, I can start to get comfortable with where they're headed. I have a little bit of concern about the abundance of flat roofs as well, as well as I think it's a project that is in the beginning phase, when I see the drawings, I see design development left to be done. Um, maybe my reaction, and I don't, I don't want that to be a criticism. I want that to say that that it's got to be developed, and I need some more information specifically that they are going to implement the things that they're going to do. Which is one of the reasons why I asked: Is it a homeowner or is it a spec? Because we've all been involved in projects like this, and when things don't get identified on speculative houses, they don't get implemented. And then we're as a board left struggling with not being very, very uh, specific about what we're approving. I agree with yeah, you. I, 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 agree with, I agree with Ron on that 100%. But I, I think they are scratching an itch that Nashville as a metropolitan city is starting to have. And that is something that steps out of the bounds of what is typical. And um, you know, we see these all over California. Um, their, their images are probably are, you know, in the rural countryside of Europe in places, but the inspiration image to me are the ones that start to sell it for me. I've got to be convinced that that this project is going to do just that. That they're gonna get there. Right, I, I, and I so say this with respect, I think they're going to. They, I mean, it's a great property, a right. great start. Um, so what- struggle, So in some ways, I struggle with the flat roof everywhere. Well, I think we've seen other projects come before us with more detail in them, Ron. Is that what you're saying? We've, we've had dimensions and more notes on the other. Well, this is certainly projects. a project. Yeah. Yes, without the details is what he's saying. This is certainly a project where, where wall thicknesses and the setting back of materials, all the things that we're seeing a little bit in the rendering, but more you go to their, their inspiration images, there is a ton of implementation. There's two yeah. projects 
on the on his board of houses around Belmead that I was involved in. And I know what we had to do to get those details to work. And that's what I want to make sure we're going to get. I'm not saying we won't, but I, this board was put in place to make sure we get that. Sure. I'm just trying to figure out what we can, if we want to defer this, what instructions we want to give for what we want to see. One, I think we need to have the elevations with clear notations on the details of, of use of materials and where they're going to be. He's referenced this French limestone cap. Let's see it. Right. And let's see it at scale. Um, and uh, uh, the other details that are in there, they're, the wall section that they have in their drawing shows a two by six exterior wall. That's not going to accomplish. I'm, I can go to the plans and see thicker walls. So that leads me to believe they're on top of their game in terms of what they're doing. But that wall section right there is not gonna allow for the details that they're showing in other areas. And I'm not, so, saying, I'm not saying they're not going to do it. I'm just saying we need to make sure we understand where those are because that's what's gonna make this project successful. So, I mean, that's, a, that's a obviously great points. Uh, let's go to the floor plan really quickly. And then also, I just wanna um, add to that is, you know, for sure, I mean, I didn't know uh, specifically how much detail we needed to show, you know, on an elevation to a board. I know for BZA, we were asked to keep it very, very simple you know, to make it very dumbed down almost to make it a simple conversation. So we can definitely uh, talk about that. Um, the other thing is, you know, when we're talking about very custom artisan items, you know, we can indicate like the, the cap, uh, we can indicate that that will be a certain depth or certain size um, for those limestone caps. But to, um, it will be a little bit of a challenge within the time frame we're working with to be able to say um, the design of it in terms of the profile you know, for instance, and how detailed we can detail that profile and if it will be manufactured exactly to detail will be difficult just because it is all very custom features and custom pieces that we're hoping to, it's almost like designing our own furniture on the house, right? Like we're kind of designing those profiles for the thresholds of the windows and the doors and, the, and it's not something atypical, not done, but because we're working with someone in France makes it a little bit more difficult, but I, I hear you 100%. I, I can appreciate that. And I think that, um, uh, not that you're being defensive, don't be defensive. I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, that yeah, I'm not at all. detail Just that you're describing, I'm fond of, and I recognize that there may be nuances to those, but I fall back to my broad summary of this. For this house to pull off what you're wanting to pull off, um, and I think for the board to start to come up, we've got to know, and you've got to identify that with some more specificity to us. So when we approve it, uh, if and when we approve it, I should say, um, that Lyle can be sure that it gets built that way. That's what we're after. Um, I'm, I'm complimentary of where you're headed. I, 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 my summary is, is that I think we're gonna need more identification detail. I think it needs to be developed it, it, you're telling me it needs to be developed. You're still working out the details and profiles. And well, two, I, I like, I like um, the bunny's comment is that I'm struggling with the amount of flat roof. Yeah, that, that was my question saying, you know, we, I don't want to send him down a road of giving us a lot more detail on a plan that we ultimately are going to ask for the roof to be changed. And that's a big challenge for us as well, just because right. the way we design in general, everything, you know, we, we, like I said, we've had these discussions before in the past because there's a lot of decisions we wouldn't have made, you know, in the very beginning, you know, months ago, three, four months ago, if we didn't think or know or somehow have that indication uh, that it would be okay. So, uh, it, and I know it's all part of the design process. So I, I understand, you know, if someone doesn't feel comfortable in a certain way, uh, but it is, it, it would make us and make me rethink a lot of the, the moves and the, the, you know, gestures and the massing in general, if that was something that wouldn't be able to be approved at all, you know? 
Lyle, could you speak to um, when it went before the BZA for the flat roof and you said there was plenty of precedent in Belmede, can you describe some of those houses and perhaps it will make us feel more comfortable that there are, you know, a lot of flat roof houses in Belmede? Well, typically they're going to be contemporary and we right. do have a caveat within our ordinance that addresses certain style homes with flat roofs as contemporary. And this would qualify as far as passing the Board of Zoning Appeal. Uh, obviously, they don't look at the design qualities like, like this commission would, but there is uh, room within the ordinance for a flat roofed home. Typically, it is contemporary. And that is how I feel about this home. That is contemporary, but it's using a high-end materials. And so the, the, the all flat roof does not bother me, but I want to make sure that as a group, we give good guidance for what, you know, if I may not be the majority in our group. Yeah, Jeanette, I, I, I'd say I concur with what you're saying. It doesn't bother me. What I'm doing is I'm looking off off to the side left of me and looking at his inspiration images because I've got them up on my computer. Me too. And um, Can we bring them back up on the computer, the inspirational images? I, I think that I might be asking the applicant to be more specific in, um, in just which one of these ones we need to be looking at. I look at the one that's top right first slide that to me captures I'm, I'm sorry, where are we? In the inspiration photos, the first file, I've got not mine up. The house made down no, one. No, no not not, those. It's not that right, far. Right below that no, se no, 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 section. No. Go back. Go, go back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here. There. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the one that captures what he's got on paper is this one right here. Yeah. I could be wrong. Um, it has a very distinct classical proportion to it, uh, a, a top cap with a very pronounced belt course that starts to establish classicism, things like that. Um, and I, I don't want to design the project for him. Um, no, and the one right below it too, which also has that with the but, ivy. But, yes. but I think you're right, Ron. That one has a formal cornice before you I get to the parapet. Right, and that's that struggle between modern and classically mm -hmm. uh, formal. And I think that's part of my, my comment back to, I think this is things in a development phase, as much as he's even saying it, we're still developing the, the cap work and the detail. I think it needs that process. Yeah, I, I would agree. I concur. Can we keep yeah. going down with his inspirational photos? I want to look at a few more of the roof lines of- And I think, you know, Ron's comment are perfectly correct you know with a style like what we're describing on the first two images it's a very fine line and it is all in the details between how much you strip away and it becomes something stark and you know unacceptable to certain in how far you add details to kind of soften it in, our, in a certain way because it's it's a question that you know it's going to come up I think a lot with you the board as well as more modern things get built and modern certain style modern plans are expected on how far, you know, you can take it, for instance, or yeah, and where that line is drawn between the details, you know, like for instance, that image <clears throat> on the right, for, uh, if we got rid of the roof line, for instance, that's already behind a parapet per se, there's no details on hardly any, de there are details, but they're monotone and they're kind of invisible. Yet it's still, I, I think that maybe the movement of the formality would, everyone would agree. It has a classical, um, evokes a, cla a classical atmosphere about it. You know, just in the strength of that stucco, the banding across the top, you know, elements like that. I mean, would everyone agree or do you find that too stark as well in its own way? It seems to be a borderline. In the windows, but the windows also match that style. They match the softness of the stucco. And then the age of that certainly helps as well. Yeah, and the coloring and the tone. And yeah, the softness so. of it. But yes. and they are not, it's not all flat roofs either. No, but the, the roof is behind the parapet. And no, but it still has the, it still has it there. You still see it, whether it's behind the parapet or not. You still see the, 
I guess the argument would be is is the flat is the roof behind the parapet help when you create a strong cap or does it actually just kind of you know I mean is it helping the architectural gesture because the lines are kind of off you know removed it's the architectural question obviously that no one can answer whether or not I feel comfortable with it, you feel comfortable with it but for me it feels like a fake you know when you're trying to hide a, a flat roof or a pitch roof behind a parapet wall in that way I think the the very bottom picture that you have your inspiration shows more of a stark parapet wall that does not show a roof behind it um, and that is more of a completely flat roof structure on the right down there to the right. Yeah. So, yeah, and it has a lot more detail as it goes up toward the parapet. There's a lot more, more classical sort of elements to it. I will yeah. come in and say that of his inspiration images, that's my least favorite. Mine too. It, well, because right. the scale feels off on it. Right, and I'll, and I'll agree with that. There's a formality about it that just doesn't make sense for that style at all. I mean, you're, you're, you have a plan that has this kind of two top towers um, on both sides of an entry that's replicated on all sides. It doesn't roll the corner very well. It's just not a very strong, but yeah. I mean, in the windows being a stark black contrast to it, all of a sudden evokes something different, right? Yeah, I go back to Every architect loves to do this and every architect hates to hear it, um, but it's development. I'm looking at the, the drawings now off screen um, and there's a lot of compositional things window wise, I'm sure Bunny would be reacting to as we ratchet this thing down. Um, that again, the success of this is going to be where you take it is it truly modern or is it going to take it to this top right image where it's, it's, it's this um, contemporary formal um, and um, I don't want you to misinterpret the, the, the pitch roof thing. I asked the question is, is what was the decision to not go pitch roof um, anywhere? Um, and I think that's in your development process. Well, are we far enough into it to be able to phrase um, emotions? Um, I'm happy to make a motion to yeah. defer being uh, clarification of style and material, specific material use. I would say those two things. I would maybe add an increased detail notation on um, the banding and more on the facade. I'm sure that, that someone can say that more concisely, but we need more detailing on the plan. More detailing will do it, yes. Yeah. On the elevations. Yeah, so yeah. can I just make one um, su suggestion or question? Um, could, you know, these are very specifics. So that's good. Uh, like we mentioned before, um, you know, if it had to go to a pitch roof, it's it's good to know things like that. Our, 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 if we defer it, um, can you guys come up with something a little bit more specific to, so that we can make sure that we are hitting, you know, the right chords for the next meeting, per se, so we're all on the same page versus keeping it so open-ended. Um, you know, in, in keeping the process going two or three meetings or four meetings, you know, down the line. I agree. I'm not opposed to having it all flat roofs, but I think everybody's going to have to speak up on the committee to, to know how that's going to be met at the next meeting. I think it needs to either be contemporary or be sort of pushed into this uh, stylistic Mediterranean you know style uh it seems like it's straddling between modern or contemporary and uh classic style so i think it needs to land on something solid yeah gabe and i would concur with that um i'm just looking at the drawings i, I think it's a development where they take it 
whether or not it gets how that that cap gets handled is there an introduction of a secondary cornice belt course line that starts to introduce that classical base middle cap element to it and i'm not saying that's i'm not trying to design it for them but uh there's a composition study i the, the other comment that i would have is that i struggle with the number of windows that are not in, in there's several elevations where they're different sizes adjacent to one another and it starts to lose its success when i see that i know that's a plan driven thing as well but I, I'll, I'll be focusing on the front first um again i i'm excited about the, the project i think it um, the images and where you're trying to take it. Um, I'm respectful of. And I would agree that I like that your inspiration photos, but I don't think the house is there yet at that level. Um, and the house that this seems to most resemble right now was the last one that we all said that we dislike them. We, we, didn't like as much on the inspiration photos. I think that we we need more details. And I, I heard you say earlier that the BZA didn't want details. Well, we're, we're not the BZA and we're very specific on details here. Yeah, uh, that's fair. That's very fair. That's, that's what we're here for. And materials and how the materials are used and the size of the materials and the finishes are extremely important to us. That's what we're about here and the architectural integrity and how it uh, relates to the lot and to the landscaping and to the other homes around it. Those are all the things that we're tasked with evaluating. I'd like to also add about the windows in that front elevation. There's a lot of different, um, a lot of different sizes. There's only, um, you've, yeah. you've got a, you got a, a rectangle, then you got an arched one, then you got two with, shutters on them and then one large one and then one arched one and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of consistency across the front elevation well, well i mean uh do i need to defend or is it just is it just opinions or comments i mean i can you know we can deliberate all day on the architecture you know whether the reasoning why every decision's made is it necessary now or I think I'm interested in seeing where he takes it. And, and again. Yeah, I agree, Ron. It, it is not ready for us to make a decision on. Um, I agree. And, and as, as an architect and respectful of his work, I hate, I hate, um, you know, but then it, satisfying five people, I've recognized how difficult that can be. Um, but I, I want to bring summary and say I, I, the paradigm shift in Nashville that has been occurring and has rapidly accelerated over the last nine months to 10 months from incoming um, citizens is driving what we're seeing right here. Um, and it's a reflection of where we're potentially headed. And that's a, that I, I find that refreshing and kind of exciting to see. Um, you know, maybe others don't. I do. Um, I just want it to be respectful of what's around it. I understand, you know, as we have an influx of people, and it's all, you know, that's going to happen. But I also think that this does. We're losing you, honey. Should be on Westview. Hey. Bunny, I, I didn't hear that comment. I would like to hear that comment. I just, I think that right now, this does not look like a house that I think should be on Westview. Can you be more specific though? Just uh, sorry. Uh, I, I think we've tried to be very specific. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, I can I give a you. second? Can I get a second to Jeanette's uh, motion? I'll second it. All in, uh, Bonnie? Aye. Uh, Mal votes aye. Gavin? Aye. Ron? Aye. Jeanette? Aye. All right, thank you. 
Is that a 60 day deferral or 30? Let's do 60. 60, okay, up to 60, all right. Second item. Application for a certificate of appropriateness for Tom Chapman, 300 Jackson Boulevard to construct an addition of more than 35 feet. And Betsy Pogue, I believe you're up and I will share my screen here shortly. Betsy, you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Sorry. I'm having technical difficulties. Um, thank y'all uh, very much. I am uh, Betsy Pogue. I'm working with the Chapman um, who live at 300 Jackson Boulevard um, to do an addition uh, to their existing um, Tudor style home. Um, the um, house position um, is such that um, it's located to the far east of the property. So the addition um, is going to be on the west side of the house. Um, and that is because that's really the only area that we have um, to, to place it. Um, my goal for the addition is um, to be very respectful to the original architecture of the home uh, in scale and form and style. So what I wanted to do was place the um, addition um, such that it was set back from the front facade um, and um, also bring the roof line down so that it looks um, more, it's more subordinate to the main part of the house. Um, the addition materials are all gonna be um, the continuation of what is on the house, which is brick and the half stucco um, timber that is in the gables. Um, the roof materials will also just be a continuation of what they have already. Mission, I'd like to also uh, add that they came to the BZA last month and passed as well. And Lyle, was it um, was it in front of the BZA for a side for a side addition or? Yes, uh, due to the topography of the lot, mm -hmm. the house was situated on the lot. Uh, let's see there. You can see the building envelope there. That's that's why it came to the board because okay. all the envelope there to the left fell sharply to. To a lower elevation, and the there was an existing drive. Okay. I think it's nicely well done. Nice job, Betsy. Thank you. We have the windows will they match the um, house as it is now also um yes or i'm trying to up? the windows will um, be wood windows and the existing house has um, a couple of different styles um you can see on the on the front um they are uh, um they're all double hung, but the, the pattern size is a little bit um, different on the front as it is on the back. So I was trying to mimic that and, and complement that on the front as well as on the back. Um, I might add also that the front bay window right now um, has no mullions whatsoever so um, it's just clear fixed glass so what i'm showing there is new windows to be replaced um, by the uh, clear glass that has no mullions in whatsoever 
Oops. Is um, hey, this is Jeanette. Um, was that a was that originally just planes glass, or had that been changed and you're um, taking it back to its original? It well, um, it's hard to say what the original. It looks like that this bay window was an add-on. Um, okay. It cantilevers out from the floor, so there's no foundation to it whatsoever. Um, and obviously the the um, big fixed glass units um, were not original to this house. So I'm thinking that there was a, a window. I don't know if it was a bay or not, but it was. I don't think it was original. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to take it back more to what would have yeah. been there. I'm looking at the photos of the house, and that's going to be a huge improvement. Can, yeah, can we look at the photos? I've, I've driven by it, but I'd like to see. Yeah, look down at the bottom, the bottom photograph. Uh, having those be divided light windows is going to be a huge improvement. Mm. Oh, gosh, yes. Yes. yes that will be. Big time. Well, I think this is a are good example. Are you going to keep the brick? Or are you going to red? Are you going to... I um, yes, it's been a stay I'm break. sorry. Did anybody hear that, Anne? Um, I didn't. I didn't hear the question. Oh, are you going to leave the brick, the red brick? Or are you painting the brick, or is it going to stay that color? Um, I, I I think we're keeping it as is. We're going to try to match the brick as close as possible. So you, okay, so you think you'll be able to match it? it we're, that's our goal. Okay. Does um, the new addition have copper gutters as well? Yeah. Thank you. And the uh, try to maintain the rafter tails and pretty much all the details that are on the house. I think it looks great. I think it is, you know, basically taking the house to actually will look better. Could we see the west facade with the addition, the elevation of the west, the west side? We've got front, back, and garage side. Okay, so I guess it would be the drive side so. would be facing west. Yeah, that that one right there is the west facing where you see the garage doors. Okay, so you'll see that driving down Jackson. Uh, oh, no, that's the side. No, um, no, that's the rear. Okay, so what is the side that you'll see when you're driving down Jackson of the addition? What are, what are it's we the next one. That it would be the street elevation that right one, there. The front elevation. Go down I one. No, the front one, but the side elevation is the one I want to see. That's it right there. That. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very attractive. Really good. Um, is there anyone else in attendance who would like to speak for or against this proposal? That being said, let's close the public portion and board. Are we ready for a motion? I make a motion that we approve it as presented. And a second. Uh, I second that, Jeanette. Uh, Ron? Aye. Uh, Jeanette? Aye. Uh, Bunny? Aye. Gavin? Aye. Mal votes aye. Thank you, Betsy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Betsy. Next item under new business, location of Vintage South LLC, 113 Bellevue Drive South, for the demolition of existing home property of significance and construct a new single family home. Ron Ferris, you are representing, and I am sharing my screen. Board members, anybody need a break? No. No, let's get it done. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Y'all are the best board in the world. I'm. <laughs> 
Well, uh, so we're here to consider uh, two things. One, the demolition of a structure, and then should that pass, we would be then uh, asking the board to consider the new design. Um, prior to taking on this commission, um, I have visited the, the site and toured the residence um, several times. And in short, my investigation and discovery informed my opinion that the resident does not check the criteria boxes outlined under our um, properties of significance. I can dive into those a little bit and we, you guys can do it obviously in deliberation, but I don't, we could not determine that the property um, possesses integrity of design, materials, workmanship, uh, setting, location, feeling. I'll dive into a little bit into that. It, it's um, a cottage or bungalow. It had, it's hard to determine what its materials, original materials are. It has been covered in vinyl siding and many of its other uh, items of architectural detailing, though sparse, have been replaced and are covered with maintenance-free materials. It's a utilitarian structure, I would describe it as. Um, it lacks um, just a, a broad detailing that one might categorize as bungalow. Um, it has scale and proportion of that, though it doesn't possess the ceiling heights and things that I would say put it in a high category. The images that you're seeing, there was an addition made to the right of this house um, that is not authentic to the original structure. And then there were modifications made uh, to the original house. There's a rather awkward um, sort of bay down that bottom right photo. But in short, I, I've been through it. It's, uh, it can be occupied, but it does not possess a high level of a, of a style or detail. You can see the columns in the front left uh, picture. Those don't appear to be original. It's just a very simple concrete pad front porch. Um, the We could not determine that it ever had anybody that was of significant living in it or that designed it. I'm anxious to hear how we start to require people find out about those certain things about who designed homes, but we could not ascertain that. Um, happy to answer any of those questions, but I think that's probably the first consideration is, is the discussion of, um, is it a home of significance? And our presentation is, is that it's not. So you have 19, Ron, it's Jeanette. You have but, 1920s in here. There's just no record of when this was built. Well, the, the, what we found on the record was 1920s. I don't, I think it was built around in that period. Um, okay. It's certainly before 1939. Um, but uh, I didn't go to Metro archives or anything like that. And that's, you know, maybe for another discussion, we do we start to do that. But um, it's other factor that I don't, find as contributing is, is that it's for its position on the property. Um, if you'll go to the site plan, Lyle, it was uh, oddly placed to the front left side of this property. Um, I, I can't determine why it was, but it, it's dashed in red light there. So it is right. front left center and except for a small sliver of the addition the rest of the house is out of compliance. So it doesn't possess a, when you drive up to the house or you're approaching it, it doesn't, to me, possess something that, that contributes to the street. It sets forward of the other houses. It seems to be, uh, well, it's just illy placed. Mm -hmm. Does it abut Tell Me Mansion? It does, I believe. I don't, I don't think it does. It doesn't. Maybe it's up. Well, Scotland goes. Well, right it's a, yeah, Scotland does. It, it it abuts the corner of the plantation there. Yes, you can look at my vicinity map. Yeah. It abuts part of the property that is at the corner of Scotland and then abuts that 
Um, it almost appears it would have been a double lot at some point. And it may have been. I, I, I think that um, it, uh, mm -hmm. I, go, going through it, I can't take anything inside of it that gives me clues as to sort of how, I, I think it was just a very utilitarian, and I say that respectfully, it was just a utilitarian home for somebody at some point. Right. They may, may have been working uh, mm -hmm. in and around. Um, respectful of bungalows, um, but it doesn't, I mean, there are bungalows all over the historic areas of our town that are leaps and bounds above this in terms of their detailing and their presentation and their kit of parts. At some point it was covered entirely by vinyl siding, including the window casing, the exterior, which lead me to believe that it's, it's, it's original maybe wood siding had either failed to be maintained or they didn't want to maintain it anymore. But what you're seeing on the left, if you go to the middle photo, you can see an addition of a porch. And then on the left of that screen and porch is another addition. So those are not original to the house. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the columns in the front that have like, that go straight into the porch. I don't see any integrity of design. I certainly do not see this house as something that is eligible for listing in a national register of historic places. I just don't see anything significant architecturally about this house. And I, I agree with Jeanette and also it just, it looks like it's really been neglected and a hodgepodge has been added onto it. I mean, those are clearly not original columns. Yeah. Um, and just, and I, I agree with the ladies. I concur. I think we can stop unless somebody else wants to talk about yeah. it. I don't think we have to be convinced. Any unless further. there is th anyone, there may be somebody audience? from the neighborhood who would like to speak. Yes, anyone? I can say that this addition was done in my time because I approved it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's funny. Mm. Well, then can I make a motion to um, approve the demolition of the property and then we can discuss the application for the new building? Yes. Second. Okay. Um, Gavin? Uh, aye. Mal votes aye. Jeanette? Aye. Bunny? Aye. All right. New house. So, um, Back to the site plan, Lyle, if you would, please. The Give a, a brief description of the property and its topography, and then I'll dive into uh, style. Uh, has this been before BZA yet, Ron? It has not. It has not. Okay. Just clarification. Thanks. <clears throat> um, the property is uh, a bit irregular, but it widens as it grows towards the back. It has a very, um, I think, uh, comfortable building envelope. The property slopes from top left of its corner, or not bottom left of this drawing, to bottom uh, right of the drawing. Slopes uh, a full story, if you will. So the house is a, a very good candidate for, and what we've done is put parking um, garage down underneath uh, the house. So garage will be very hidden and um, out of street view, which I, I love that. Um, the effort is, is to nestle this house back into the site. We'll talk about the, the front courtyard and its proposed wall that enclose it, but the nestle, to nestle it back in there and to add the landscaping and trees that I'm showing to bring it uh, in the fold of the landscaping and trees. It's, it, I've been down Bellevue, south a lot lately and it's got a lot of trees and a lot of sort of um, uh, umbrella characteristics to it. And we wanna bring that back into this as we knit it back into the site. Stylistically, this is uh, specifically chosen to be French eclectic. Um, diving into um, just some descriptions of what a French eclectic house is and it gives French eclectics give you a broad range of things that you could potentially do, but because they have subsets to them. But um, 
their primary identifying characteristics are tall, steeply pitched, hipped roofs, occasionally gabled, uh, though we're not doing that, without dominant front facing cross gables. Um, eaves uh, can be flared at wall junctions use of brick, stone, stucco, wood wall cladding, sometimes with decorative half timbering. We're checking um, uh, specifically those boxes of steeply pitched hip, hip roof, use of a stone uh, predominantly on the front elevation, uh, intentionally for some cost saving measures, but the primary pieces of the front are stone but if you look at the remaining other three, we have a continuous stone base as its platform. Lyle, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down a little bit, but that stone base would be continuous around. We're um, we'd be using a Tennessee native uh, limestone in a random pattern as, as rendered. That stone base at this back elevation would be slightly canted uh, which is a common detail for these type of houses to give um, that sense of groundness. And then I've introduced the, the common element of at that base, the use of arches with some stone coining. As you make your way around from this side, um, you'd see at the garage, we're doing something similar with some carriage doors uh, and windows into a laundry room to, to continue that theme around its base. Once we remove or change materials, it, it's two cladding materials of stone and then the second cladding material would be a wood shake siding. Most likely that will be Jay Hardy's uh, product, which is very authentic looking, but it is a cementous based material, but very authentic looking. And what is the reveal on that? Siding. Um, in terms of its ver the vertical dimensional. Yeah, I mean, is it like a five inch seven or a seven inch? inch? I think it's seven. Six to seven. <clears throat> yeah, it's not. And is, five. The, and is the roof also shingle? The roof is shingle, and um, it, it will be right now. It's being listed as a composite shingle. If budget would allow, it'll go to something better, but. Um, it's a composite shingle. Uh, is this going to be an owner occupied house, Gavin, or is this, a, I mean, uh, Ron, or is this a know. spec house? No, it is not an owner occupied house. It is a spec house. Ron, can you explain maybe the windows? I, I guess I'm struggling most. I, I like the steep pitch sort of roofed areas, but the windows, I think. Uh, the big open panes with this French uh, sort of eclectic. Yeah, um, let's see, I'm going to some of my, well, the, one, the, the top of them are all in panes and then we were, were wanting to use a larger open pane for the view quarter out of rooms. Could you paint all of these windows? Yeah, um, but it, uh, I guess I was looking at the other elevation on the opposite side. Uh, <clears throat> that one seems a little more in scale. The, those, those large panes on the front elevation and that other sort of garage side seem pretty big proportion, I guess. Okay. Let me go back to the front. Let's go back. Because I certainly, you, you could make a case for adding panes into those windows. Is that what you're saying, Gabe? I mean, I'm sort but, of thinking that's kind of, it's spreading along, you know, you've got a long sort of window there, especially in that front through the, what is that opening, I guess? You've got like a little opening that looks into that courtyard. I do. That is um, a that tall window behind it is into the sort of two-story uh, main living room. But the introduction of more panes there could certainly be. Yeah, maybe. I would you can... like to see panes everywhere. I mean, I feel like that it's just, I, I don't, I don't like the idea of the. Storefront. Of, yes, it's just a lot of, it, it is storefront. It feels is there like any way to bring a, an element 
through there, Ron, that would where, where your header is over that left-hand wing, could you bring an element that came across that sort of continued to sort of split those window? Oh yeah, there's a way to introduce more panes into the windows. Okay. Sure. Um, what were, why did you not? Tell me your rationale behind not doing. Well, it's, a, it's an interpretation of, of, of a common double hung window and maybe this graphic isn't doing it, but a, a double hung window often has a large bottom open sash and then panes above. They're called six over ones or, you know, four over ones. Um, but it, it, it's a subjective thing to me about the number of, of panes you put in there. But um, yeah, I think it would be a much prettier house if it had panes. Um, sort of, I think it would pull the, the character of it off more, seems like. It's, okay. it's more, that would be more in keeping with the bottom picture at the very end of your um, presentation down <laughs> there. I mean, that to me, um, no, I, I've got some of the black and white photographs that, that show the, um, the and black and white. The one you're referencing is probably the one that's most um, targeted it, to this. It's, it's in the application. Is it an um, inspirational photo? Yeah, look look down at the bottom of that the and see that right there. That, yeah, that that's, to that's me, nice. Yeah, that to me with the full divided light, I just think is really attractive. I um, I have seen what you what you're putting there, and I've seen those you know upstate New York people who have big views to capture. Right. I, I've seen that, but I don't know I don't know what views we're capturing there, but you know that that's a preference if it if it were your client's preference to have the plate you know that's one thing but since this is a spec house i think this would be prettier understand yeah i mean I, I, my... you've hit on what this picture was the one i was most uh yeah debated it's on. really pretty <clears throat> i love that yeah i like this too and i like i like I think the change in the windows on that really would, it, it warms it up. It's just a little more inviting. If I, I'm, I don't know that that's the right word to use. Um, maybe a little more approachable, uh, just. I guess if there's a middle element as well to sort of break that whole window up in the front, that might, I know what you're might saying, help it a little bit. Let's go back, yeah, can we go back to that front facade? <clears throat> Just as a thought, you know, that. So uh, help me understand this middle section here, Ron. So you're gonna have limestone around. So this is not the door into the home. This is more just a view. And is that wood in the center there in front of that tall window? Is that, what? what is that in the circle? That is, there are three apertures through that stone wall. The one on the right is a gate that would open up to a covered long walk to the front door. Okay. The one in the center is nothing more than an aperture with a wood scalloped rail. Okay. The one on the left is the door. A, a, a symmetrical to the right. on the right. So okay. once entering into that if you go to plan, what I was doing, once entering into that through that gate is that you would then be in that inner courtyard. Yeah. Uh, Which I like the idea of that. I think that's interesting. Yeah. I yeah. Um, from, a, from a siding standpoint and from how you could use that front courtyard and open the house up into that, the main room up in there, and I'm, I'm very excited about how that space could be used. I think it's, I think it's a gorgeous house. Um, and I like, that'll be great light in that middle room too, but it's the one room thick. Yes. But, and the main room yeah. is tall yeah. and then you're seeing behind that big window is in fact just a, if you go to the second floor, that's a bridge walk between the two stairs, if you will, that then look down into that main room. Um, I think at that bridge walk, maybe you could do some type of division for the windows, you know, where that, yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be an area that you might be able to add a little dimension on the front to kind of break 
break those windows up. Just a thought. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, can we go back one more time to the front elevation, please? So the material, let's, I just, if you could walk me through the materials again here. So you have the limestone around the aperture and then you have. Oh, that's the, the stone that we're using. Um, this wall that caps, that would be capped in a cut stone, but the rest of the stone I'm seeing as a, as a Tennessee limestone, even the larger coin pieces, I'm not seeing that as, okay. as limestone. I'm seeing okay. that as a complementary to the lot, to the Tennessee okay. limestone. I'm not wanting those, those coin stone. Yeah. I'm not wanting those coinings to be overt and French okay. I'm wanting them to be textual subtleties of the stone. Okay. And then is that, what is on the wall? behind that, what is that wall? All the way back behind that wall, right and left of that large window, that is the wood shake siding. Okay. Similar to the inspiration image that Jeanette was referencing. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are on the dormers, on the sides of the dormers? Well, you're on right, far right and left on this drawing, you're, that's roof, but on the- uh, Up over the front window, I guess. The I would see side. the right and left side of that would be the wood shake as well. Okay. And the front would just be some type of wood, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then at the front porch, you're seeing timbered columns with timbered brackets. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Sure. I wonder if the committee the importance of this wall in front to help ease it through the BZA since this is one of the items that will be going to the BZA. And is it because it's over three feet and it's a wall, it's a stone wall in the front? I mean, that is, that is correct. Okay. In, in the past, and this is where Lyle and I've discussed this and Lyle's correct, is that it's, a, it's, an, it's an interpretive matter, but that wall is inside the building envelope. Right. And attached to the well. And it's attached to the mm -hmm. house. It's and part it's of the to house, the house design. But yeah. As here to date, these elements have been put in front of the board, but it is purposely in the building envelope for my my argument that it's my argument is is that I could fill that mass with house. True. Fill that area with house. Um, now, if I brought this outside of the building envelope, I think there's maybe a larger discussion to have. Mm -hmm. What is the height of the My, house, Ron, in, in relation to the other houses on the street, too? How tall is this house, and where does it stand on the street? Its tallest point is around um, just under 40 feet. That's that main body, which is one of its uh, most important elements. I mean, um, French houses have this center main portion and then the left and right segments, uh, I think are in the 30, 32 or 33 feet. The house, I, I don't know that there's a house on this side of the street that's as tall as this. Um, I don't what have- houses, it would what about to the left and the right of this house? What style of the houses? I can't, I drove by to look at the lot. I've, I've got- At the bottom, the there's a whole list he has presented at the bottom. Can you show that while that show all the houses that are around it? And, you know, my thought is this is going to be a larger house on the street, but I do like the fact that it's not a box, that the roof line has completely been um, you know, the, the, the roof line is so detailed to take, to bring the massing down of a larger structure. I really appreciate that. It does sit down in grade, doesn't yeah. it, Ron? Yeah, it, it does, does. fall in yes. grade. Yeah. Of every house that you're seeing on the screen, the one that it has the most <clears throat> respectful, um, sort of homage to is the one top right, 110. Uh, um, but the other homes, 
on the street um, are arguably one story uh, and don't have uh, the, the same type of massing. They're more box-like, but it, it's massing and composition, Jeanette, and you're correct, was intentionally broken down right. to play with that scale. Yeah, and it, it brings it, it, it takes something that could, you know, in less deft hands would be a very large massing to get that square footage, but you've done such an incredible job to have the roof line fit and really fit into the houses that are around it. And it's a, it's a larger house, but this is the way you do it. You know, if you're gonna fit into a neighborhood that has some smaller houses. It is, and it's um, absolutely correct, but it's also, I think, one of the larger properties on the, uh, yeah. of that street. Um, I've grown quite fond of that street just in its location. I think we're going to see, well, I think the, the house that's going up on the corner right. we, we had a lot of uh, input on, I think is going to be successful. And is this the same, then Lyons, did I say it's the same guy? It, it's, it's a different brother. It's his brother. Oh, his brother. Okay. <clears throat> Can well, we see get, the, get the garage side elevation? Sorry, Mel. No, go ahead. I was going to see if we can see the garage side elevation again. Not getting paid enough for this. <laughs> <laughs> no alcohol involved. <laughs> yeah, just I think if the windows had a better um, you know, visual, it, it would help to break that break that up. So the shape that will be on the wall, will it be painted? Well, yeah. where it will be a painted shake. And then I, I really like the idea of a shake roof on this, Ron. I just think there's so much roof here. That's a lot of roof. Well, the style of the house, it could be very attractive in shake. I don't disagree. Um, but I, I think that respectful of, of what I think my clients uh, trying to do uh, as, as we you know, encourage these, these type of projects to advance into a much higher level of detail, I'd, I'd like to be um, respectful of that budget side of it. Um, I think we could find a really good composition shingle that would work well. But yes, would wood shake look good? Absolutely. Um, Do you have an example of the stone that you'll be using, like a photo or inspiration or an example? Um, I don't have one. It, you know, it's going to be the Tennessee limestone, which is the most readily available in that. I mean, it's that ashlar pattern that we're wanting to use that random ashlar pattern. And it's six or eight inch or whatever bed stone. Yes. Yeah, it's full depth stone. This no, I'm sorry, that might've been in your spec. It may have been in your spec guideline, I didn't. Yes. Uh, Gavin, you wanna make a motion for approval with the um, recommended changes to the windows? Um, I, I would say I would make a motion for approval pending the uh, window, uh, what approval or review by the board? Uh, we could probably dic we could probably give that to uh, Lyle. Okay. I I'll, think so. I'll, I'll second that. that. Okay. All, a, a question there on that motion. Sure. That's all of the windows on the house? Not just the front, the all of them, correct? I would say, I would say so based on the uh, consensus that we had with the inspirational um, house that was presented at the, the black and white photo. Yes, short answer. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you for the uh, Bunny? Aye. Mal votes aye. Um, Gavin? Aye. And Jeanette? Aye. All right. Great meeting, guys. Thank you, board members. <laughs> Four would, hours I, worth. I would like to say, um, I want to thank each one of you for, for doing this. I know this is not an easy thing to do. Tonight was very challenging. 
especially that first agenda item. But you guys do an amazing job. You're very thoughtful. There you are over there. Very conscious of everything that you're 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 ruling on, and it does not go unnoticed. I cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate it. I know I'm speaking for the citizens of Bell Mead. Well, thank, thank you for you. giving me the most of very well guys. Talk to Thank you, Lauer. Thank you so much, Lau. You all are great. You all are great. Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye. See you, Mayor. <laughs> See you.